summarize it in a very, very short sentence. In India, we had the trad tradition of learning English through our eyes, which means our exposure was only through reading and not through our ears. The natural language learning process happens much more through listening and speaking rather than reading and writing. This difference we were not able to perceive in the older days. But anyway, that doesn't matter now. So there were corrective measures. And when corrective measures were taken, I think a new genre called ELT in India took shape or sort of some experiments were done as far as ELT in India is concerned. Now, again, as I said, ELT is largely a spread of colonization, etc. Let's not go into it. Well, let's look at the various branches. What are the various things that we need to take care of when we discuss ELT? While teaching language, there are certain essential components. One major component that we cannot ignore at any cost is grammar. Of course, grammar is absolutely, absolutely necessary. necessary. But the problem in teaching grammar is manifold. We have to decide how much grammar we need to teach, what type of grammar we need to teach, or which grammar we need to teach, and when to teach it. How much to teach, what to teach, and when to teach. These are three crucial questions that we have not been able to answer even to this day. There have been a large number of problems, and let's not let's take it up. Now, there when I say which grammar. Obviously, the answer seems to be English grammar. But within English grammar, there are a variety of grammars. We have something called the pedagogic variety, with which all of us are familiar. Means a grammar that can be taught. Okay, we have for a long time, we had the example of something called a grammar written by two people, Ren and Martin. And earlier to that, we had grammar written by a person called Nelson. Okay, now these grammars were good. But today, they are outdated. They were excellent pedagogic grammars. Today, the most popular pedagogic grammar that we have in market is something by uh, Raymond Murphy, Essential English Grammar. Or there is another grammar called uh, Oxford Practice Grammar by somebody called John Eastwood. John Eastwood. These are some of the good pedagogic grammars. So we also have, along with pedagogic grammars, systemic grammar. I will not talk about systemic grammar, which is a huge field in itself. We have communicative grammar. We have functional grammar. In fact, functional grammar is replacing pedagogic grammar in a big way today. And these are some of the types of grammars. There are many, many more. Which of these should we teach? Is it the pedagogic grammar? Is it the functional grammar? Is it the communicative grammar? Or is it a mix of all this? That's a very difficult question, question to answer. All teachers of English certainly need to be familiar with pedagogic grammar. And today, if we are particularly teaching in at the school level, I think we also have to be familiar with a bit of functional grammar. Now, pedagogic grammar largely provides some aspects like concepts of grammar. For example, all of, our, all of us are familiar with the, something called parts of speech. Now, parts of speech need not necessarily be eight parts of speech. There can be many more. In fact, there, can, there are more than eight parts of speech. What are these labels? How do I define these labels? It's not enough if I know the definition of the labels and the labels, but I should also know whether I'm able to identify these labels and use them properly when I use English. That's much, much more important than just knowing the label and its definition. And they also provide lots of examples for each of the label and each of the definitions. Um, is it possible for me to look at some of the examples that are given in the book Rather than copy the same example, can I produce my own sentences 
and can these sentences be as meaningful and useful in life okay i cannot simply go and ask uh, sumana what is your name sumana i have i know the, a sentence like what's your name as a question and if i use because i want to use this question if i ask sumana what is your name sumana i don't think i'm using that question meaningfully at all okay you should know the context when you can use a question you should know the context when you can use a sentence a assertive sentence a declarative sentence a interrogative sentence all these things one has to know it's not enough if we know the labels okay so that's one aspect of elt how how do we teach grammar how much grammar do we teach what type of grammar do we teach and how do we teach these are some of the things that elt discusses that's first part of the elt design the second part deals with vocabulary okay there used to be a linguist called da wilkins david wilkins who was who was one of the earliest persons who did a lot of research in using linguistics in language teaching he has written a book called linguistics and language teaching and this book came out sometime in 1972 and the epigraph on the book says um without grammar something can be understood okay this is a very important sentence without grammar something can be understood but without words nothing can be understood i think that's a very very loaded statement when wilkins said this i think all of us realized how important words are most of us know the words and we stitch them together without really caring for grammar and yet we are able to communicate but can we allow this to happen for a very long time or should there be some sort of an intervention somewhere so that we can ask the speaker to use the language properly that's that's the idea of teaching grammar um teaching vocabulary in a systematic manner in a foreign language context began quite some time ago uh, probably in the year 1905 with one linguist called thorndike thorndike and he was collab in his experiments he was collaborated by, by another person called large large and thorndike they produced a word list and this word list had about 5000 words and they were so, sort of uh, they devised a crude way called frequency counts by which they said okay here is a list of 5000 words and these are the most important but that was a very preliminary list and several other people worked on it they refined it one of the one of the well known names is ck ogden who gave us what is called the basic english basic there is an acronym basic english and this was again refined by people like hornby pama and others and the lastly michael west who produced what is called the general service list of english words the general service list of english words has uh, listed about 2000 words 2000 essential words which are uh, very very good and general service list is a valid list even to this day somebody like paul nation who is a big name in today's world accepts michael west's gsl and says that if you know gsl and if you read any text any book in english you are likely to understand 85% of the book with a knowledge of Uh, all the words in gsl just that is if your vocabulary is about 2000 words as prescribed in uh, gsl and you read any book in english you are likely to understand 80 85% and there is another list called academic word list which was put together by coxet and if you have this knowledge your comprehension level increases to about 90 to 95 person means vocabulary is fairly fairly important and gsl as produced by michael west has remained a reliable list even to this day now exposing learners 
to language through reading is an excellent way of developing vocabulary. Michael West experimented with this. With his 2,000 words, he produced what are called graded readers at six different levels, or six, he calls them plateaus. And through this, he was able to teach a lot of vocabulary. Is it possible for us to go back to that today? Probably not. There is there's much more that has happened. So vocabulary studies have developed those specialized lists. Now we have not only academic lists, we have uh, uh, registers, several registers, register for medicine, register for nursing, register for engineers, a variety of registers. These registers also become extremely, extremely important today. Now, if we have all these vocabularies, vocabulary lists, and if we get the essential words using what, is, what are called corpus studies, there are again uh, a dozen corpora that are available to us. These will help us understand the variety of way, a variety of ways in which we can use each word or this is called the texture of a word and this is also technically called the concordance how is a word used in a particular context in a particular way how can the same word mean different things in different context this is something that can be studied so this is all done and how the, there are um, uh, many many more things that are said about vocabulary and how to teach vocabulary what are the aspects that one has to take care of how can one develop vocabulary on one's own all these fall under a particular field of study called the lexical approach uh, a man called michael lewis worked on lexical approach and that forms the second part of elt design the first focuses on grammar the second aspect focuses on lexis. Grammar and vocabulary, they account for the content of language teaching. Now, if I simply have the content and no methodology, I don't think I can just put across the content. I also need some sort of a methodology. So in order to teach these grammar and vocabulary, we need to organize them in a systematic manner. Okay, How, which, which type of sentence do I teach first? Which words do I teach first? Okay, How do I sequence them? Which is easier, which is more difficult? There are, there are certain, there is a criteria by which we can uh, find this out. Again, frequency is one, one of the criteria, but that's not the only criteria. Now, there are guiding principles, and once we organize them, we get what is called a syllabus. Okay, How do I design a syllabus? How do I make the items on the syllabus available to a teacher? Do I simply say, okay, here, are, here is a list of six grammatical items. Here is a list of 200 words, and you are going to teach class one. Go and teach these six grammar items, and... 200 words. If I simply say that, I don't think any teacher will be able to go and do, or go and work, because all these remains an abstraction. So what, what are the various things that we can do? Um, suppose we ask a question. Suppose you are a teacher. You are all teachers. If I simply ask, give you the contents, the questions you will ask are quite a few. How do I make the items available to the teacher? What words can be taught along with grammar? If is, is it, do I teach grammar and vocabulary separately or do I teach them? Okay. Class, classify the words the same way we can classify items of grammar. And there can be many, many more questions. What is a context? Does this one, if I have one context, can it be up, applied or can it be used across the country? Why across the country? Across the state, perhaps not even across one city if the city is as large as uh, 
Calcutta. So we have to have different contexts for different children. How do we train our teachers to get familiar with this? So all these aspects are discussed in yet another part, design feature of uh, uh, ELT, and that is called curriculum design. Curriculum design is a huge, huge topic. It talks about who is my learner? What does my learner need? In what way can I take my, hold my learner's hand and make him journey through the language learning path? Now, all these aspects are discussed in curriculum design. Now, one thing I would like to say, if I don't know my learner, I cannot teach my learner. I cannot teach anything I like if my learner does not need it. Curriculum design is built on these principles. Know your learner, know what your learner wants to learn. Teach only that your learner needs. This, is, this seems difficult, but once we get into the uh, course design, curriculum design, probably that will become easy. Content of language teaching goes hand in hand with teaching strategies or methods of teaching. Now, teaching strategies are based on a set of principles uh, derived from psychology, as well as uh, sociological studies and contemporary beliefs. Okay, I cannot teach somebody ignoring my society. The society is very important. I have to cater to the needs of the society so that what I teach becomes useful to my learners to become proper citizens to live in that particular society. If they become misfits, all the teaching that I have done becomes useless. So this is something that we discuss when in ELG when we think of methods of teaching. Now, why does this happen? Let's look at it from a slightly different angle. Now, any knowledge is dynamic. It's no knowledge is static. Even language, language is complete, very, very dynamic. It's both organic as well as dynamic, which means it keeps changing from time to time. It keeps changing continuously. If knowledge changes, the way the knowledge has to be transferred, the way the knowledge has to be acquired, the way knowledge has to be uh, taught also has to change. So our strategies also have to be static. With, I cannot say um, the, the English language has changed, but I will teach exactly the same way that uh, it was taught 100 years ago. In fact, when, when we say Renan Martin grammar is not relevant any longer, all we say is it's not wrong. Certainly it's not wrong. Renan Martin grammar was relevant 100 years ago, which was and it described a language as it existed about 100 years ago. Today, it does not fit into the system of English that we have today. Today, English needs a different type of grammar, and that grammar needs to be taught differently. That's all we are saying. This is this is a, this is an example I would like to state here. So we suppose we think of uh, the changes that have come up. There are a large number of methods that uh, uh, we have used for teaching English. I'll not mention all of them. But we, we are all familiar with something called grammar translation method, which was probably the earliest that people thought of, at least in the European context. Uh, in Indian context, we have had uh, certain other methods. Uh, we also have now something called the direct approach, then the structural approach and the communicative approach. Then we have task-based approach, a variety of approaches we have had. Now, are all these uh, essential or is it necessary for us to think of something beyond this? Okay. Um, some, sometime in the year 2005, one of uh, the Indians who is working in San Jose University, his name is Kumar Vadivel. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He came out with another 
approach or he came up with another suggestion called beyond methodology okay. now sh why should we stick to our methodology is it possible for us to think beyond methodology and think of something that is really feasible in my classroom i'll just mention one more name and that's a name all of you should be familiar with that name is dr ns prabhu dr ns prabhu who did a lot of experiments in the area of english language teaching particularly his bangalore project is extremely extremely well known he has used a term called plausibility okay it's a beautiful word the term is called plausibility this is a term he used sometime uh, in 1982 83 uh, 83 around that period used this i just quote prabhu <coughs> by means by term plausibility quote plausibility is not a fixed concept okay all the methods that i mentioned grammar translation communicative language teaching etc etc they have certain principles and it's a fixed approach plausibility is not a fixed concept as long as one maintains alertness it's very important as long as one maintains alertness to events that's around you and such perceptions can gradually lead to a clearer and comprehensive view of what to do what does Prabhu mean by this he says as teachers it's my responsibility to keep my ears and eyes open i should be sensitive to the needs of my learners if my learner does not understand something i should not blame the learner instead i should try to alter my way of teaching such that i become useful to the learner that's what is called plausibility is it possible for us to be as malleable is it possible for us to be as flexible as the needs of our learner and become at least to some extent useful to our learners if we can do this i think we will be good teachers that's yet another design of elt elt design that's the fourth part in this context i'd like to mention something that happened in the state of west bengal way back in 1983 okay uh, 1983 was a very significant year when lots and lots of experiments happened in indian elt situation west bengal board of higher uh, secondary education invited british council to help them redesign their school curriculum especially the curric uh, curriculum for teaching english and this was called a celt project or key elt project uh, one of the experts who came from uh, britain his name is david carver david carver came from um, murray house college of education in edinburgh he is a brilliant man he is a brilliant man he's still around he is a brilliant man and totally totally pragmatic in his approach or his uh, his methods are plausible as prabhu puts it now he looked at the entire situation he made the entire situation as it existed in uh, west bengal and he found most of the teachers were absolutely absolutely comfortable with something called the structural approach that is they went to the class they gave a sentence they developed a substitution table all the children repeated those sentences the children were able to produce their own examples children were happy the teacher was happy the parents were happy but what was the learning outcome the learning outcome unfortunately was zero there was there was no comprehension as far as learners were concerned david carver viewed this situation and he wanted to introduce the communicative language teaching 
And when he thought of communicative language teaching, things like pair work, group work, that's one thing. Second thing, the most important thing that he thought was structural approach goes in a sequenced manner. So if I teach uh, present continuous today, tomorrow I have to teach simple past. There is no way I can escape this sequence. Is it possible for me to escape this sequence? No, he did not go to the grammar syllabus. He went to the letters of the alphabet. So he said, why should we teach A, B, C, D, E, F in a sequence? Why can't we break the sequence? And he created certain charts. And in fact, they are available in uh, books called Learning English, which are produced way back in 1984, 85. Uh, uh, that, that should be available in, in your state. Uh, you should be able to see it. And he said, look, while we break the sequence, while we involve the children, it's not possible for us to completely change our teachers, switch over from structural approach to communicative approach. So let's think of a new method and this was called cost, C-O-S-T. C-O-S-T simply meant communication oriented structural teaching. Okay. In my class of English, which is about 35 to 40 minutes, I teach English the way I am comfortable with using structural approach for about 20 minutes. 25 minutes. All my children feel happy that they have learned some grammar. In the next 10 or 15 minutes, instead of continuing with the same thing, I will make them use the language, giving them a few tasks, very, very simple tasks. Uh, learning English is a coursework which has a large number of tasks, and these were produced by West Bengal Gov uh, Board of Secondary Education. Uh, probably they are still available in some of the places in uh, um, Calcutta. You, sh you should be able to see. This was one brilliant experiment that was uh, conducted in uh, West Bengal. I'll not tell you why this experiment was withdrawn uh, very quickly. In, in fact, this existed only for about three years. After three years, it was withdrawn for uh, political reasons. Okay, all I can say is that it was withdrawn for political reasons. I'll not go into the details of it. So we have looked at grammar as design number one, vocabulary as design number two, curriculum design as design number four, three, and methodology as design number four. And I have also mentioned, given you one illustration of plausibility, which is part of methodology. Now let's look at design number five. There are two more designs. Um, design number five deals with what is called evaluation, okay, assessment and evaluation. So we have contents, we have strategies, but we also have to grade our learners. When I say grade our learners, it's not saying you have passed, you have failed. No, that's not the thing. At least it, is, it must be possible for us to assess how much my learner has learned and how much more my learner needs to learn and what is the type of help I can give. That's the meaning of evaluation. Meaning of evaluation is not uh, either I'm successful or not successful. More than not successful, what more do I need to do in order to help the rest of the students who have been left behind. That's the idea. So for this, the major tool that we use is something called the question paper. So we have a set pattern of question paper. And largely, this is based on memory. Okay, or I have a text and the textbook yields to a set of questions. And is it and do I have to have questions based only on the textbook? Or can I make my textbook an excuse and develop questions in such a manner that the questions can be answered not using memory, but using the understanding of the text? 
okay i let let me slightly deviate and mention it here many of you are involved in uh, writing the units some of you at least are use I, since i see the names now when we are writing the units for pg elt program in each of the units we have some tasks and questions these questions should be application type we have in fact in my comments i have quite often said this what do i mean by application type it's not reproducing what i have already written but is it possible for me to under, show my understanding by applying it to my classroom situation if we can do that i think we will have done a better question paper so these questions application type of questions i i have used this term they are copying proof means students cannot copy because each student can write his or her own answer and if the students write their own answer each answer can be different and yet the answers can be correct is it possible for us to frame questions in such a manner that each question leads to multiple correct answers and i should be able to read every answer see now let's look at reflect on this when i go to evaluate a, uh, evaluate papers in an examination if i read one paper or 10 papers and then i'll have formed a opinion about what question demands what type of answer and the subsequent papers i can rush through i don't need to but if we have question papers like this every answer sheet has to be read as carefully that's the that's what i am trying to say and how evaluation can be an important aspect of learner's life and teacher's life and developing a good question paper is part of teacher training is the fifth design of elt now there are other designs also now we have said all this uh, now we today we have the invasion of computers we cannot ignore computers computers are all around us and today we are using computers extremely efficiently from various places we have got together in one on one but platform without having to travel so can this computer be used as far as language teaching is concerned is the last part of the design we have certain things called uh, web 2 web 3 tools we have artificial intelligence we have a variety of other things using which we can use language teaching ict in elt is also an extremely important thing now if we want to do all this all teachers have to have an ex good knowledge of psychology of education sociology and linguistics unless we know how a child learns we cannot teach somebody the, the language okay you you must have observed small children learning language it's a fascinating experience and most of the language learning theories that we have today as far as linguistics is concerned they have emerged from observing small children acquiring language there there is a lot of truth in it so how can we implement some of these principles in our language classroom can teachers become parents to their learners which means can they share the same type of love that a mother shares with a child can the teacher share it with the learner can the teachers be tolerant to errors can the teachers make offer corrections in a much much more gentle way or follies punishable or follies excusable these are some of the things that we have to know now we can get lots and lots and lots of uh, inputs from all this now these are the six different aspects of elt and i'll conclude my talk with just one thing 
why should we learn english is english learned merely for developing proficiency in the language or are, are there other reasons why we learn english english is in fact should be learned not for the sake of english but english should be learned for the sake of uh, as as a service language it's a language that helps my learner cope with other subjects the learning of other subjects if if i if my student is a science student should he he should be able to read a good textbook in science using the english that i teach in his class whether he passes english or not is not important but is he able to cope with his chapters in a book of science in a book of history in a book of economics in a book of commerce all these things that's that's why i call english as a service language english is a language all around us so in life in fact many years ago a well known scientist linguist called kachru mentioned this if in india you have to survive it's not enough if you have a knowledge of hindi <coughs> you also have a knowledge of hazar english there are a large number of places where hindi just will not suffice but hindi properly fused or properly integrated with some english will take you through any part of india this is a life learning skill english is a life learning skill so english has to be taught for survival english has to be taught as a service language english has to be taught not for the sake of itself i have in this in these few minutes i think i have taken about 35 minutes or so i have just given try to give you a birds eye view of uh, the range that elt has especially in uh, india um many aspects will be discussed by the paper presenters in the course of the day today uh, there will be a lot 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 more <coughs> uh, discussion however if there are some questions now if you have already posted them on the chat box i'll uh, have a look at it otherwise uh, your questions are welcome i think one of them will monitor and i can uh, take the questions as 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 they come to me i wish all of you a fruitful time and thank you all for patient listening thank you you're welcome sumana you can thank you sir thank you thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank we are really enriched oh thank you thank you <laughs> thank you thank you sir thank, thank you. you thank you professor mohan raj it's an excellent talk Oh thank you sir it's thank excellent you, sir. thank you sir mm. so we can have the questions sir if uh... vijay is here <laughs> i think i think shumana will coordinate yes sir hello shumana yes sir uh -huh. yes sir i think we'll take the questions at the end uh, uh, yes yes uh, yes okay no all participants are requested to put their question in chat box Professor Mohan Raj, you will answer yeah. after the session. Okay. Okay, sir. Right. Huh. So we move so, on to the next session. Next uh, um, session was uh, to be begin at twelve ten. So it's twelve ten minutes ahead. Um, we have still have ten minutes time. Um, so shall we move on to Professor Jai Shankar Bosu for the next? Uh, for his presentation oh, if, if, if we have time then shumana please take two or three question yes um, uh, we we can take three questions then we have okay time. okay okay fine fine so let's choose uh, professor mohan raj from chat box yes yeah. uh, i'll just check i request you to, uh, you to answer uh, two or three any answer, as you like uh, i don't see any questions here In the chat box. Uh, 
Yes, sir, we have a question from Atulu. What is the best possible way to introduce the best textbook for the secondary school level? So, what's the best possible way to introduce the best text? Um, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. Now, the, there are two bests here. <laughs> okay, the best textbook is a myth. There's nothing like a best textbook. In fact, I didn't talk about uh, textbook analysis. That's also part of uh, design, one of the designs. I'll just give you a small, um, some, some information about how to assess a textbook, whether it is good or bad. Uh, I'll not go into some of the details like the cover, etc. Of course, the textbook has to be attractive in the first place. It has to be sturdy, well bound, etc., with proper illustrations. But let's come to a lesson. How do I know whether a lesson is easy or difficult? Uh, it must have been our experience uh, if while teaching that some students come to us and say, "Teacher, I like this lesson a lot," or "Teacher, I just don't like this lesson." Why do learners say this? So there are two factors. One is called the vocabulary load. First, first factor is called the vocabulary load. The other one is called the syntax load. Now, what do I mean by this? Vocabulary load means a lesson, the length of a lesson can be decided by the number of words the lesson has. So let's hypothetically say I have a lesson and this is for class uh, seven or eight. And this has about 1,000 words. If there are 1,000 words in this textbook, as a textbook writer, how many new words can I introduce? So if I say there are about 25 new words in introduced in 1,000 words, now 25 is to 1,000 makes it 1 is to 40. Now, as Michael West recommends it, introducing one new word with every 40 familiar words is an excellent ratio. But generally, what happens is the demand made by the Board of uh, Education, every year we have to teach something like 600 to 700 words. In each class, we have to teach about 600 to 700 words. And if we multiply this by 40, we have we have to have a textbook that just the lessons which run into about 30 to 35,000 words. Now think of the volume of 35,000 words. The volume will be huge. It's not economically viable. A teacher cannot handle so much of uh, reading text. The learners will be deterred by the length of the textbook, the size of the textbook. All these things happen. So generally what happens is a textbook writer reduces this ratio to 1 is to 20. And in order to compensate for this, provide something called a glossary. So this is how the vocabulary load is taken care of. If too many words are introduced in a lesson, then the lesson becomes difficult and less lesson can become boring. Exactly similarly, we can also think of the grammar load. In general, of course, the, long ago, each lesson used to introduce only one structure. Today, it's not like that. Each lesson can introduce more than one structure. And all these structures are bound by something called a function or in, in some sort of a block. They come as a cluster. And these clusters perform a particular are relevant to a situation or a function. Now, very often what happens is if we have a lesson and if two or three functions are introduced all at one time, the lesson becomes overloaded. Is it possible <coughs> to reduce or introduce one function in a lesson, take the supplementary functions through exercises thus reducing the load on the text. This is something that we have to do. Okay, so If we go on doing this, then the text becomes amenable. Okay? And in spite of all the care you take, every textbook that we produce will have some weakness or the 
other. Therefore, uh, a, a concept like the best textbook is a myth. And the best way of teaching it is also a myth because the way of teaching depends on who are my students, what is their competence, what is their social background. Many of these things depend. It depends on many of these things. And depending on that, I'll have to teach the same text in different ways for different sets of students. That's my response to Atanu's question. So we have another question from Dilip. He is asking, can English language be taught through natural interaction without keeping in mind the grammar? Yeah, in fact, it can be. Um, in fact, that's a very good way of uh, uh, teaching. But for that, there are certain conditions that we have to fulfill. Means if you have a very small class and if you have more or less a homogeneous type of a class, probably this is possible. Or there have been experiments called teaching English without a textbook. Is it possible for us to teach English without a textbook by simply creating a large number of situations and using dialogue as a uh, process. This is possible, but uh, it can be possible only at an experimental basis. In the university where I used to teach, we always have a group of people called uh, International Training Participants. ITP is the program, International Training Program, where we get um, people from nearly 80 to 85 different countries. Most of them are senior officials. Some of them are diplomats they come to us only for about three months to improve their proficiency in english we don't use any textbooks we use only dialogic process as the method of teaching and uh, we involve them in series of conversations uh, we give them a lot of group tasks and we help them develop english language but that can happen with smaller groups with highly motivated groups it cannot happen with a large number of students in regular classes i don't think we can experiment that because we don't have the luxury of time that's a, that's a drawback with us shumana i need to know something from professor mohan raj yes, yes sir. Sir. could you give me, yes, you give me a time yes sir. yes sir okay thank you professor mohan raj for your excellent talk on design, curriculum design, and ELT design. I have one personal problem. Yes, uh, at the time when I was in active teaching yes. at Kalani University, uh, they have graduated with honors in English. And after their graduation, they obtained admission to the PG Department of English. So I was supposed to teach not only a small component on linguistics, but also a major areas of English literature. Knowing fully well two-way traffic interactions will not be possible in the classroom situation because students are incapable of communicating their views mm. on a particular literary topic. Mm. So they remain silent all along in the classroom situation. Mm. So under the circumstances, mm -hmm. when their education at the school level, mm -hmm. where when their education at college, undergraduate college level, mm -hmm. is not properly tailored or trained. How could I expect my students at the department to be very active in interactions? with their teachers. And to your surprise, I tell you one thing, sir. In the rural areas of some colleges in our country, 
I used, I started teaching career at Mangrul Peed, 40 miles away from Akola in the state of Maharashtra. There, I had to use uh, Marathi, sometime Marathi language, often Hindi language, I had to use. Sometimes I had to make them understand by some artificial language, like gesture, posture, because I was not very confident in Marathi. That was the dismal situation of English in our country. Even today, you go to the remote place in Assam or in West Bengal, okay. you yeah, should find... Know, please be brief. Be, please be brief, because we are, so, uh, time is running oh, out. Oh, 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 Your oh, oh, session oh, oh, is in the next session. I am I'm sorry. I am sorry. Okay, okay, I'm okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no problem. Just, just complete your... Uh, uh, question. Okay. What, what, what is the solution? How do we face this problem? I mean, I will not face this problem. I'm a retired. No, I think this is what you have explained is a typical uh, college uh, teacher's classroom uh, in the sense it's, it's very, very typical in most of the rural, perhaps even many of the urban centers, this happens. Uh, one, one of the reasons is um, we have not thought of uh, training uh, training teachers at the tertiary level. This for a long time. We had not thought of this. Uh, the university where I was teaching was established primarily with the primary mandate of training teachers to teach English at the tertiary level. But uh, one institute could not uh, obviously reach out to several people. But that's uh, beside the point. Uh, the student silence can be understood from two or three different points of view. One is lack of competence, as you have rightly said, but that may not always be the case. Because if we look at the ethos of Indian ethos, uh, speaking in the class is supposed to be a disrespect shown to the teacher. There is a very interesting book uh, written by a person called Dart Bavo. Dart Bavo is from Vietnam. He has uh, collected data from most of the Southeast Asian countries, and he calls this book Silent in the Language Classroom. Now, most of us, when we were introduced to communicative language teaching, where the classes were supposed to be noisy and not silent, that came as a rude shock. The learners were not prepared. The teachers were not prepared to such a situation. That see, the, the silence could be the result of not just student incompetence. It could also be a sense of respect. But you are also right in saying that they were just not familiar with literary topics. How? So is it possible for me as a teacher to introduce to them a topic that they are familiar with where they can come out with one or two responses and from those responses encourage them to attempt to answer something a little more difficult. It's like climbing stairs. You have to climb one step at a time. So rather than stand at the top and ask my student to come up all at once instead can i climb the stairs along with my students how do i simplify the literary text for example um, shakespeare is it possible for me to introduce shakespeare through a summary and then help him with some of the familiar examples and then go to the actual text where the learner probably can his or her reactions. This is this is the only thing I could think of right away. Maybe there are more uh, solutions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to our next talk, which is by Professor Joy Shankar. Dr. Joy Shankar Basu, Associate Professor in NSU. Over to you, Joy. Thank you, Sumana. Thank you. And Sir Mohan Raj's speech, lecture, in which we thought and 
my very special and deep thank to Professor Mohan Raj. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I have to round up my say within a slot of 20 minutes and I have to manage all my views and to telescope them anyway. To begin with, I welcome all my lovable auditors. I welcome Sir Mohan Raj and Sir Vasudev Chakraporty apart. Everyone present in this webinar. As a member of the department of ELT. Now, I'm supposed to tailor and doctor my views on ELT in order to suit it to our learners need, especially SLA, that is the prime need of the day, second language acquisition, and to fit my say into a frame that will subserve the learning needs of our students as far as collaboration and idiom are concerned. Uh, I do admit that I have to talk from lexicogrammatical perspective within the given slot I have been graced with. Before I go into collocation and miscollocation as well, we have to understand one thing with reference to the other. I want to share my view on language very briefly. Like the stream of consciousness, language is also a flux. While consciousness is random and multidimensional, it may cut across any border. But language stays linear. Language remains linear. If it is linear, it has to be associative, additive, collative, and collocative. If I am permitted to use the term collocative, an adjective of collocation. Collocative word chunks are, I personally believe, stepping stones to syntax and semantics, be it in elliptical, fragmented expression or complete sentences. They are the gateways for L2, second language learners, L2 to achieve L1 competence, first language learners' competence and fair in speech and text. Language is letter by letter, that is morphophonemic, and word by word, that is morphosyntactical flux of echo of our motor sensations, reflexes, and organized thought process. In cases, a single word may be expressive, but by and large, collocations with literal and extra-literal, idiomatic and figural charges build up to our communicative com competence at par with native speakers, that is the users of L1. L1 stands for first language learners. Among others like Smith, Nettinger, T. Carrico, uh, 
Professor Mohanraj referred to, Lewis Michael, among others like Smith, Nettinger, and D. Carico, Lewis Michael shook the entire ELT world in the late 90s by undermining or underplaying the role of grammar and stressing the lexis collocation as more effective pedagogy or learning tool for SLA, second language acquisition. Compatible word chunks are more effective than individual and isolated dictionary words in learning L2, that is second language. Basically, it's an approach to lexis and lexical collocation. For SLA, lexemes are more important than, than a rule of grammar. Personally, I am in favor of a synthetic approach, which is what we call lexico-grammatical collocation. My field of study today is collocation. Personally, I trust a system which is inclusive and synthetic. So I am in favor of a synthetic approach, which is what we call lexicogrammatical or lexigrammatical, if you permit, collocation. Conventionally, collocations are split into lexical collocation and grammatical collocation. But from the but from the two that is lexical collocation and grammatical collocation working in tandem that is lexic grammatical collocation we can harvest both vocabulary and rules of grammar, especially for L2 learners. On my mind, there is another class of collocation, which is not, as far as I am aware, which is not very much treated in any sort of literature, ELT literature. And, and I want to point up the fact that there is another kind of collocation which may be termed as transformational collocation. It ranges from idiomatic nuances to metaphoric echoes, archetypal and contextual, symbolism, especially private symbolism and other figurals. Collocations may create, particularly in literary context, a kind of transformational collocation or co-occurrence of words word, that may lead up to metaphoric echoes, symbolic tones, and tones, and other figure else. An accepted collocation can co-extend to a transformational signification. That is my point of emphasis. And I am not aware of any intensive study so far done in the ELT books about this aspect of collocation, that collocation, co-occurrence of words, transcend their limits of uh, lexical uh, limits of lexical limits or semantic limits and encompass a luminous realm, a psychic realm, a spiritual realm, a mood, an evocation of mood, and all this comes from collocation or co-occurrence of words, and here words are turning extra literal. 
So this kind of extra literal transformational collocation is very much in use in poetry and creative literature that is part of our life as well. And in this uh, use of transformational collocation or co-occurrence of words, we find the charge of poetic fire and philosophy and elements of emotive style of language to put it in a catchphrase. If there is natively a natively preset collocation of words as a meaningful unit that goes into the making of language, there must be as well miscollocation. Therefore, morphologically, two lexico-grammatical terms evolved as part of ELT studies. They are collocation and miscollocation. They are to be framed off in order to understand each with reference to the other. Collocation that is additivity and co-occurrence of words that lead up to a structure of meaning and signification makes SLA in tune with the texture, flair and flavor of the native speakers, native users of language, English language here, as written and spoken by native speakers. For example, I give you an example. We use bullshit and cow dung by the native natural law of intracompatibility and co-occurrence. I cannot afford to say bull dung or cow shit. They will laugh at me. Nor can we afford to say, don't speak this blatant lie because it still not speak and there is no particular grammatical guideline as to why speak do not collocate with lie and why tell collocates perfectly with lying or a lie. There is no explanation. This comes from usage, everyday use, and they are established norms by which we are supposed to go and speak. Now, another example I'm giving. On the fine day of New Year, somebody accosted me. Merry New Year, dear. On the day of Happy New Year, I have been greeted by my friend. Merry New Year. Then my friend will reply, okay, my sweet dear, don't sneer and be bitter hearing me say Happy New Year. You seem to gift me a stab injury. No, dear, on this Happy New Year, you are to get a stab wound. So I'm a little poetic in this part of my speech. Uh, it's not stab injury. Injury does not collocate with stab. We have to say a stab wound. Why not stab injury? I think no individual expert can explain it. It has just come down from the tradition of language sp spoken and written. So be it noted, please, that the right collocation is stab wound, not stab into. Right collocation is to death, not till death. We, as second, uh, uh, as user of second language, English as second language, use till death. But uh, I don't think any native speaker of English will use 
if he is educated, supposed to be educated till date, there is no such collocation as till date. It is to date. Number three, oh, somebody says it's raining deeply. If I say it, say to my beloved, she will reply, dear, I object to your deeply. It's raining heavily. If I object to heavily, then my sweetheart will tell me it's raining torrential but never collocate deeply. At this, point, at this point, I have to clarify one thing to my lovable brothers and sisters who are in teaching profession, that in collocation, there is uh, a combination of two elements, base and collocate. Rain is the base part, and that Adverb uh, deeply, which is a miscollocation, heavily, torrential, in torrents, adverbial phrase. These are collocates. They combine so, perfectly. They combine so, perfectly. So, if I would intervene, would you wind up in one or two minutes? Hmm? Okay. How much time I have? So you have one or two minutes? Two minutes. Give me two minutes. My uh, uh, my uh, principal focus is that uh, there is a barrier for the second um, language users. That barrier is vernacular hang transparency fallacy. Uh, that's why we tend to say, I love you dearly. Love cannot be dear. You may get dearness allowance. It may be, I love you deeply. I love you intensely. I love you passionately. These are all collocations and miscollocations. Uh, some days ago, I came across a letter uh, a letter of protest against Metro Railway announcement, doors are closing, and the letter writer said that doors are being closed. No, again, it's a hang spilling over to the second language. It's a hang from the vernacular to the second language. This is a uh, this is an example of quasi passive. Doors are closing. Rice is selling at rupees 60. These are quasi passives. Rice is being sold is correct grammatically. But as far as lexical collocation is um, concerned, rice is selling at rupees 60. Uh, my last point is uh, very little slot. Uh, I will refer to corpus linguistics, explosion of interest in computer held databases of text from where we get um, a plethora of lexical collocations. Um, and my final say is that lexical collocations are more important than grammatical collocations. When they clash, lexical collocations will override, will override grammatical collocations. And Lewis Michael highlighted this fact that lexical collocations are the keys to learning the second language. Okay? Okay. Thank you, sir, for your enlightened speech. So I think we are we have already came to the conclusion of our first session, and we'll have a lunch after this. So please uh, join with us 
or sonam can you can you have some questions or we should because already we are behind time yeah uh, can i speak for 2 minutes yes yes please yeah uh, it has been a very engaging in our session good afternoon everyone and indulge me for 2 minutes as the webinar convener as i would introduce the team who have put this webinar together first of all i would like to thank professor s mohan raj for his active involvement with the webinar right from his timely inputs in designing the webinar poster to the keynote speech the wonderful keynote speech which has illuminated us a lot thank you sir my heartfelt thanks to professor vasudev chakravarti for your kindly for kindly agreeing to participate in the webinar and your valuable inputs in the inaugural session I thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Shubha Shankar Sharkar, for his inspiring leadership. Thanks to the Director, School of Humanities, for being a constant support for all the stakeholders that we have faced, and to the CLTS for CLTCS for organizing the webinar. I am very much touched and impressed by the participation of the exceptional panel of speakers. who have contributed to the webinar within a short span of time thank you for engaging with me we are awaiting to hear more of your contributions in the following technical session thanks to professor js basu member of the organizing committee sir without your valuable inputs the webinar the reality which we have today and thanks to dr intaj for your technical assistance all throughout and finally i appreciate the participants joining the webinar in time most of you have some in time i think you did a wonderful job thank you everyone and have a wonderful time so we are having lunch break we were supposed to leave by 12:35 we are leaving by 12:38 um sumana when will it and be after the again? lunch break at 1:15 we join again by 115 will join again by 115 oh. oh and thank you very much please join with us as you have joined and please please join with us as you have joined with the similar process okay okay thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you all thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am our journey over
স্যার আপনি যে সব কথা বলবেন সবগুলোই কিন্তু এখানে রেকর্ড হচ্ছে তো একটু মানে সবকিছু স্কিপ করে একটু চলতে হবে
স্যার বাসুদেব স্যারকে বলবো স্যার একটু আপনি অডিওটা আনমিউট করুন নাতে কথা বলতে পারবেন না বাসুদেব স্যারকে বলবো বাসুদেব বাবু একটু স্যার প্লিজ আনমিউট ইউর সেল অদারওয়াইজ ইউ নট এবল টু টক হিয়ার নো বডি ক্যান লিসেন টু ইউ ইউর অডিও ইজ মিউটেড স্যার it's fine so uh, sumana ma'am can you start our next session sumana ma'am are you there yes please go ahead okay so uh, this is our first technical session and uh, it will be moderated by myself 
Mohammad Intaz Ali, and we have two speaker here for this session. Uh, one is Professor Basudev Chakraborty, who is the formerly professor of English for Learning University, and we have another speaker here, Dr. Sumana Bondopadhyay, who is an assistant professor of English language teaching in our university, Netaji Shubhas uh, Open University. So I first uh, uh, request Professor Basudev Chakraborty sir to start his uh, discussion on dialectology. Thank you, sir. You are welcome. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Netaji Shubhas Open University, Honorable Professor Manon Kumar Mondol, Director, School of Humanities, Netaji Shubhas Open University, uh, the most erudite scholar who has given the keynote address, Professor Mon Raj, formerly English and Foreign Language University at Hyderabad. It was earlier in our days CIEFL. Uh, Dr. Joy Shankar Bosch, Dr. Shumana Bandhapadhyay, and all our friends and colleagues. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, am I audible? Am I Intel audible? In touch? Hello? Fine. Yes, sir. Uh, what yes, do you think? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, this afternoon I am going to make an address to the basic learners of ELT on it is written dialectology, but uh, it will be better. I have shortened the spectrum. Uh, I will call it uh, language variation. So I will speak on. At the very beginning, I want to make a comment. What is that? The concept of language is more abstract than the concept of dialect and how and why it is. While I think of the language, for example, I think of the language now used by the people living in the United Kingdom. There are many English languages even in one language, one English language. I quote this line from better English pronunciation. There are many Englishes, even in one English language. There are many Hindis in one Hindi language. There are many Bengalis in one Bengali language. So, if I say I want to learn English language. Somebody may ask me, Sir, what type of English language would you teach me? Would you be teaching me the Australian English language where they pronounce die is a good die. It is it should be a good day. But they pronounce die. So if I want to teach a particular language, I have to first of all be familiar with four basic language skills. And you know those basic skills I'm not going to repeat. <coughs> so there are many Englishes even in English languages. So there are some dialects of one particular language varying from geographical location, varying from class differences, ethnic differences, gender differences, uh, which is called 
social act or social variation. I will go into details to all these later on. Now I tell you that there are many dialects, even in one language. So if I say the language used by the people living in the district of Bakura, that is Bengali language, their way of speaking is altogether different. Sometimes it may be unintelligible to me so far as vocabulary is concerned. There may be certain vocabularies with which I have least familiarity. I don't know. For example, let me give one example. In Bengali, it is called Mar, Bhater Mar. But people living in the district of Noakhali, now Bangladesh, they speak Fan, Bhater Fan. So I know the, vocal, the meaning of the word Fan, but most of the standard speakers of speakers of standard Bengali, most of them are not familiar with what actually fan means. So there are many dialects. For example, Yaksha dialect, Darby dialect, London dialect. Even if you think of the first English epic of growth, Beol, that was written in Northumbrian dialect, not in the Bavarian dialect. Bavarian dialect was not used in Beol. It is the Northumbrian dialect that was used in that great epic, Beol. So, there are many dialects, even in one language. There are many languages in one language. And those many languages are called dialects. So general, the general English language used by the people living in the, I, let me give one more example. There is no as such general American English till date. But there are many variations of English language. So far as its spoken form is concerned, so far as its vocabulary is concerned, even syntactic features are concerned, there are many Englishes, even in one American English, though there is no general American English. In Texas, the way they speak, particularly colored people, they say, they, they very often make a deletion of copula. Oh, you look, she is she very cute. Look, she is very cute. Here is, this copula is deleted. In normally, we use she is cute, she is beautiful, she is intelligent, very much she is intelligent. I can make a change in my syntax. That's different for producing special effect to my audience. So there are many dialects in every language. Whenever we say that language, the concept seems to be a little bit abstract. But if I say I want to speak in Sileti dialect of Bengali language, or I want to learn the Sileti language, Sileti dialect of Bengali language, or Darby dialect of English language, or I want to learn the language used by the 
educated and enlightened people living in London or in its vicinity. Uh, I really specific, very much specific. My teacher will be able to understand the objective of my learning. The teacher will know what I want to learn from him, what I want to learn from him. So the concept of dialect is more concrete than the concept of language. But if I say English language, it means varieties of language, varieties of the English language. English language used by the people living in South Africa, used by the people living in New Zealand, used by the people living in London or in, say, Dublin. Okay, all of you definitely at your undergrad at our undergraduate level, undergraduate English honors level, we have read. One play that is Riders to the Sea, written by Singh. She, Singh was associated with the Irish dramatic movement under the leadership of W.B.E.S. Or I refer to Sonokas, Lady Gregory's play. Look at the language Singh has used in Riders to the Sea. Look at the syntax, look at the vocabulary. Even at the time of my first reading, I had a problem to understand certain vocabulary, certain meanings of certain vocabularies, nuances of certain words. So there are many Englishes. That means there are Englishes, instead of saying Englishes, let me say there are many dialects. Excuse me. So there are many dialects. So why these dialects? Why? First of all, first of all, I tell you one thing. There is a kind of variation, dialectal variation. First of all, let me say, the dialectal variation at the level of diachrony and synchrony. What is dialectal variation? All of us at the undergraduate level have already read the growth and the development of English language by Otto Jesperson. So the book has tried to underline the progress of English language or evolution of English language from the very beginning to the 20, early part of the 20th century, including some etymological meaning of certain words. So di diachronic means historic, diachronic perspective, that means historical perspective. Look at the language of early modern English. Look at the language first Middle English period. Or after that, Chaucer's prologue to Canterbury Tales. Do you think the language used by Chaucer in Prolong or in non priest or monk tell there are 23 or 25, I can't remember right at this moment how many um, pilgrims, how many stories are there in Canterbury. It will be around 23. Among them, there, are, there is one monk tell, there are non said non, non priest tell, and others. And that is a prologue. And look at the language of the prologue. It is totally different. 
so far as his pronunciation is concerned, his vocabulary, even syntax, even the meaning, even meaning, if I divide meaning, what is meaning, what is semantics, semantics is made of two components. One is meaning, one is pragmatics. So, not only meaning, but also the pragmatics of a particular sentence, or even of a particular word, vocabulary, over time, undergo changes. So, this change is change at diachronic perspective. So, that's a kind of variation. So, and what about synchronic? Synchronic? <coughs> uh, I will study, I will learn the skills of English language of a particular point of time used by a particular community of people. In our country, our aim is to learn a particular variety of English language used by the educated, enlightened people living in London and in its vicinity. That is called standard dialect. I mean, that is the language we aim at learning. So, this dialect of London, used by the educated and enlightened people living in London, is different from the language used by the people living in Glasgow. I had been to Birmingham, I found but the people there are educated doctors in Birmingham hospitals speak a particular variety of English language, often unintelligible to me at the very beginning for a for, for a week or two, it was unintelligible because they speak a different kind of English language. They use a particular dialect of that particular region. But I didn't have any problem when I talked to the director of the British Museum because he speaks standard dialect. I mean, he speaks the dialect of that region. So, this is a kind of regional variation of English language. For example, let us give an example, few examples from my class notes at CIEFL in late 70s. Look at this word, last. This is the last point. An American will say, this is a last point, last, last. I want to buy a car. An American says, I want to buy a cat. Even I heard our respectable, honorable, most revered president, Dr. Sarvabulli Radhakrishnan, telling Kashmir, Kashmir, not Kashmir. So, he has used, it is not a question of right or wrong. Nothing is wrong in this world. I will give you the example. Nothing is wrong in this world from the linguistic point of view. If I, if I decide not to impose any value judgment or normative views on it. That's different. Otherwise, what is right today may be wrong tomorrow. What is wrong tomorrow, today, 
may be right tomorrow. So far as spoken English, so far as a living language is concerned, a living language undergoes sea changes over time. Sanskrit has a fixed grammar because there is no spoken form of Sanskrit. I'm sorry, there may be one village or two in our country where the people speak in Sanskrit. That may be a fact, but I don't know. I have never met those people. But I, I got it in the newspaper. So, a dead language doesn't undergo any change. So its corresponding grammar also doesn't undergo any change. If language changes, automatically grammar changes. If language changes, automatically the dictionary changes. So on this advanced learner's dictionary, it is perhaps 14th or 15th edition going on, perhaps I'm not sure. I was, for, for example, English pronouncing English, English pronouncing dictionary by Daniel Jones. I used to consult 13th edition. Now it may be 16th edition. I don't know. Anyhow, for example, last. For example, the girl dances. An American will say, the girl dance, dances. It's a good class, an Englishman will say. It's a good class. Class. Ah. Ah, ah, not ah. There are, I mean, I, I would request the young enthusiastic learners to be familiar with the phonetic symbols. And of course you are, definitely you are. So we don't pr look at the standard British English an Indian variety of English language. I will give some examples instantly. I will go to Calcutta. Now tell me, if I say this, if I make this statement to a native speaker of English, will he be able to understand or I will be intelligible to him? I will go to Cal Calcutta. Certainly not. First of all, there are many problems. Not problems, there is a change variations. An Englishman, geo go, they will use diphthong. Um, he, he is going, he is going, he is going. Oh, this is my home. I love your home. And our Indian Speakers will say, I love my home. That is the problem. I mean, we are, I, am not, I, I am not suggesting that we should totally aim or we will try to speak like the British, like the native speakers of English. It's not at all possible. But we have to make certain kind of adjustment. Professor R. K. Bansal, in those days, he was a legendary professor. He tried to get a variety of general Indian language emerged so that among the in Indians that variety, general Indian English, that variety of English language can be easily intangible to all persons living in different regions, different provinces of our country. If I go to the South, for example, raw, red, are you red? There were some of them, not, not all, not all, not all, not all, particularly people who live in the rural areas. Even they are also not everybody. 
they use trill rock, red. They trill them. Sir, uh, so to say we have five minutes time, so uh, it's over. Uh, five minutes time. Five minutes. Sir. Okay. 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 Sorry. <coughs> so social regional variation depends upon the variation of regions. There is another point that is standard dialect and RP. What is standard dialect? Due to the non-linguistic features, due to the, uh, sorry, owing to non, I am using the prescriptive grammar again. Duty is all right. But according to Nesville and Renan Martin, I need to say owing to, owing to or due to non-linguistic reasons. I, a particular dialect emerges as a standard language. London was the seaport. London was the papal headquarter. London was the military headquarter. Shakespeare did write in London dialect. And Queen Elizabeth used London dialect. So, that London dialect has become the standard dialect. It doesn't mean other forms of dialects in England are non-standard or substandard, <coughs> excuse me, or inferior. London dialect is superior. If I speak in Cockney, I am wrong. I am, no, not that. It is not a fact. All non-standard dialects are neither superior nor inferior. Somehow or other, for some historical reasons, that dialect of London, used by the educated and enlightened people living in London, it has become, it is called normally in linguistics, it is called standard dialect. But other dialects are also equally correct. It is a question of acceptability. It's a question of appropriateness. It's a question of the relationship between the speaker and the listener. The same thing may be right in this particular context. The same language may be inappropriate, unacceptable in another context. So the concept of right and wrong we need to, first of all, need to revise it. And this is standard dialect. And there are many other dialects even in England. And what is the difference between standard dialect and BBC, BBC English? A standard dialect related to only reading, I mean writing, reading, and listening, not listening, reading, particularly reading and writing. But BBC is directed, BBC is related to the spoken form. BBC pronunciation is acceptable all over the world because that is the corresponding spoken form of standard dialect. Corresponding spoken form of the standard dialect used by the people, educated, enlightened people living in London or in its vicinity. Even in London, this is the regional dialect, even in London, let me refer to Pygmalion. Professor Higgins, often he is known as Pygmalion Higgins. Pygmalion is a, a Greek legendary sculpture who made a statue of a woman, then he fell in love. Now you try to make a relationship between this Greek myth, Greek legendary sculpture and the play written by George Bernard Shaw. So in Cockney, in fish market, or in any local market, if you go, I'm not, I'm not talking about the present day, I'm talking about the early 90s or local market, 
Most of the people use Cockney. Let me give one sentence, only one sentence, please. I aren't drawn to nothing. I aren't drawn to nothing. First of all, I didn't understand. I asked my friend, what does she mean? That means I, uh, uh, Intaz, it is over. Intaz, hello. It's, Time is over. Okay, okay, okay. Conclude, please. Okay, I told, I told. There are, there are social, social variation, regional variation. There is also register variation, field of discourse, mode of discourse, style of discourse, and concept of mutual intelligibility. Whether it's a dialect or language, it depends upon uh, the mutual intelligibility, but mutual intelligibility is often uh, unfollowed because of the because of certain political or other reason. For example, there is hardly any distinction between Punjabi language and Hindi language. Both are both of them understand each other, but still Punjabi is a separate language. It has given the status of a separate language, and uh, though there is a mutual intelligibility. So Hockett's I concept. This was a concept presented by Charles Hockett, and Hockett's concept seems to be, to me, to me, seems to be a little bit, little bit vague. Thank you very much to all of my friends. Uh, thank but, you very uh, much, sir. Uh, you want okay. to say something, sir? Monon Babu, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, enlightened yeah. talk. So far as uh, we understood that you are talking about concept of language and how it's abstract and also regional variation. So to conclude, like to give a summary of your speech, I just would uh, like to say certain things. Like as you said, the language is not static and it's developed by age, context or maybe socio-cultural context and many more things are involved so, with it. So, so what is okay, that yeah. the meaning is changing over time and also uh, you have focus on dialectical variation. So to my view, English as a uh, language is not as a singular concept if you look at it, but it's a plural in nature. In a word, it may be called Englishes rather than saying it English language. So I think there is uh, no authority anymore that they can say that it is their language. So I have only one problem with your uh, saying that uh, when you're talking about standard and non-standard dialect, actually, I think this is more about political things. So this is just the summary of your speech. Now I, I, I'll take up, like we'll take up questions uh, later on. So before going uh, to take up questions, I'll request our second speaker, uh, Dr. Sumana Bandhupadhyay, Ma'am, uh, who is a assistant professor of uh, ELT in Netaji Shubhas Open University. And now over to Sumana, ma'am. Please go ahead. Welcome, Sumana. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. Very much welcome. <coughs> I'll be talking on this course and I'll be sharing with you some of my thoughts uh, that. I had accumulated when I was writing for the CBCS course, courses, that is, I was writing elective four. And uh, I did take into account the factors um, that are different from you know, writing. Oh, no. Can you, can you off, your, off your fan a little bit because it's noisy actually? Okay. Yeah, are so you asking? I, I will. Are you asking? I'm talking about Sumana, ma'am. Okay, okay. Hello. Hello. Any problem from my end? From your side, there is no problem, sir. Okay. Thank you. I just requested Sumona ma'am to off her fan. Is 
Is it okay now? Yeah. It's okay. Okay, so um, my talk considers the ways in which we interpret the functions of utterances in terms of speaker's intention. And thus, uh, the structure of spoken language is the domain of my discussion. And uh, this would include the way people enter into dialogue, how people interpret the function of what they say, and so on. And discuss analysis thus assumes that meaning is conveyed by complex exchanges in the participant and participant's expectations and the context in which they interact on their world language. So this complex exchange can be described in terms of functions or in terms of form. Functions, that is the use of language, and form, that is the syntactic analysis of language. So for example, if I say, read the book, please, here the form is imperative and the function is command or request. Whereas if I say you read the book, this is the declarative form with the function of statement. The speech form expressed by an individual that presents information as well as performs an action is a speech act. And speech acts are indirect and direct. So we all know that in direct speech act, the, speech, the speaker needs some information and asks the hearer to provide that information. And in indirect speech, the function and the form are different. That is, um, the utterance, if the utterance is a question, for example, can you pass the ticket? This is an interrogative sentence, but this is not a question at all. It is a request to the hearer to perform the action, that is, passing the ticket. So indirect speech acts are more polite than direct speech acts, and there are a number of reasons for this. The first reason is indirect speech acts function as a request for action, and thus they are safer strategy to find out the listener's desire to perform an action, to put forth the speaker's intention in getting the job done. Either way is true. In indirect speech act, there are some social complex assumptions or complex social assumptions in because it is always open to the listener to misunderstand an indirect request. This can be accidental or this can be deliberate. Let us take two examples. In the first example, the teacher is talking, is telling Mihir, Mihir, there is no chalk in the classroom. And Mihir is answering, no sir, there isn't. So Mihir has misunderstood the teacher's request, indirect request of bringing some chalk. So the teacher has to utter that, make it clear again. Teacher, well, go and get some then. Only then he can understand when the action is direct. In the second example, the visitor and the passerby are talking to each other. The visitor is asking the passerby, excuse me, do you know where the market is? The passerby is answering, oh sure, I know where it is, and walks away. So the passerby is taking, deliberately taking this as a yes, no question, and not speaking further or explaining further the way to the market. So these are direct and indirect speech acts. Let me come to the next one. Here. So when we are speaking, in the mic, let us take an example. When we are speaking in the mic, microphone attached to the headphone, the choice of speech gets modified and the regular speedy interactions, the vibrant high speech voice have disappeared from our regular conversations and a little raised voice is causing discomfort for our ears. And this was unnoticed in a face-to-face -face interaction. Here we are changing the function or the use of language in the new context. We are more conscious in framing our discourse and these are suited to the recording needs and most of our academic interactions are also recorded. So discourse analysis can thus have threefold pedagogic applications or three Ds in teaching listening. And these three Ds are description, discrimination and design. So the first two are for description of speech streams into segments and discrimination of adjacent utterances. So 
this is to engage the learner in our classroom to listening practice and for selecting materials specific to the discourse level for teaching selective and general listening we need to design now how this can, we can do so let us look at this chart in this chart we have taken conversational maxims conversational terms and exchanges speech acts and conversational analysis and we have taken monologues and dialogues so discourse analysis in application in conversational terms and exchanges is the interaction the application of the interaction in a two part exchange which are common in the context of like question and answering inform acknowledging complain is excusing and so on when the participants of the conversation operate with different rules and expectations misunderstanding and mutual recrimination leads to unsuccessful conversations an important aim of discourse analysis is thus you know taking examples of conversations from people from different cultural backgrounds because if we are looking at the conversations from people from the same cultural background we don't get these kinds of examples for example the common misunderstanding for men and women participants in the use of head nods the non verbal communication for example head nods at hum noises can mean two different things when a woman does it she simply indicates that she is listening and encourages the speaker to con continue the male on the other hand interprets it to mean that the woman is agreeing and everything agree, agreeing to everything she is saying in contrast when the male does it he means that he does not agree which is interpreted by the woman as he is not listening and the male reaction to it is it is impossible to say what a woman thinks and the female reaction is you never listen to the word i say so we can put our learners to observe these specific listening situations and make them to communicate while learning taking more of the examples from their surroundings we can also go for conversational maxims so in conversational maxims we have to take either authentic voice mail messages or a story a receipt and a mini lecture and how we can do that conversational maxim this is from grice so conversational maxim talks of the four maxims that is maxim of quality maxim of quantity maxim of relevance and maxim of manner so these four can be related to the earlier speech acts which jen which austin had talked about now how we can design tasks combining these all these together so um, what i had done is i had taken the commissive directives and declaratives and expressives and try and try to relate them to the speech acts which were which which we find from the theory i'm coming back to the maxims little later so let me talk on this point so we have another table over here this is talking on the speech act theory where jane austen is jane jane austen speech act theory is classified as uh, number 1 according to number 1 they are used for analyzing isolated sentences from the discourse and number 2 to assume a logical obsession that a standard sentence is a statement that describes a situation or asserts a fact and is justified as true or false so we use multiple speech acts when we are speaking and simultaneously also writing so that is we are uttering a sentence this is the act of locution we are referring to an object we are performing an elocutionary act and we are performing a perlocutionary act now this represents how we can relate this or how we can design tasks on this matching with 
the other speech acts mm -hmm. which are in very much in discussion for example representatives representatives are assert the speaker's belief and we know that representatives are not locutionary or elocutionary they are perlocutionary because they are the effects of the utterance on the listener who accepts whatever is being said and ma'am you have five minutes time please uh, yes yes directives uh, representatives and directives are both perlocutionary and whereas commissives declaratives and expressives um, uh, are not perlocutionary commissives are elocutionary declarative and expressives are locutionary and um, um, Express, for example, let me take the commissives. Commissives express the intention to commit a future action, and uh, elocutionary acts are speech performances which are internal to the locutionary act. So, if I tell the learner that you have to justify why this is not locutionary and why this is perlocutionary for the representatives and directives, and then try to um, give them examples from all the three, from the from First two and the and the rest three and try tell them to compare. They should come up with um, with the inputs from the theory and the applications in the ELT both at the same time. Um, let me now a little bit talk on the chart. Now where is my uh, this one? This chart I was trying to talk of. Yeah. So called contracted forms, repetitions, um, rephrasing, and formal and deliberate style are usually found in listener, listening discourses, for instance, in spontaneous talks. Mm -hmm. And other features of listening discourse are colloquialisms, fast space, variation in accent, natural rhythm, uh, tasks on complete, completing information, highlight these features, highlighting these features, all of these are very difficult for our learners. So the telephonic conversations are unscripted, spontaneous talk between the non-native speakers and these discourses are structured. These discourses are turn-taking, careful enunciation and slow-paced. These slow-paced discussions, which are found in, for example, scripted news, written talks, turn-taking, um, lectures, uh, sorry, um, lectures based on shared contextual knowledge and so on can be selected for developing listening skills. So, um, for designing the discourse task, we can use analysis of adjacent utterances which constrain each other. For example, if I say, have you seen him? Here we are not uttering uh, the whole word him, but we are uttering parts of the word deleting parts, um, deleting the initial phonemes for him and you, both these words have deleted phonemes in the utterance. We are also using discourse markers for speakers in the tasks such as well and you know to sing, signal interactive features. We can also use sum up of gist conversations at regular intervals using formulations. So discourse analysis work with utterances Discourse analysis work with utterances or sequences of words in specific spoken texts and in this, these are all simple, these appear to be simple, but they are also complex at the same time when we are looking at it from the misunderstanding points of view, these are, which are not present in the written text. And um, in the application of discourse analysis in pedagogy, teaching listening to the discourse analysis is um, can be discussed in terms of its task, transient nature in listening discourses in, in the spontaneous creation and real-time perception and uh, working on tasks can guide our learners to analyze spoken utterances and exchanges. So these were some of the points which I tried to share with you, you know, why, how I can, how I had applied a discourse analysis in the design of tasks and applications in ELT, taking the theory from linguistics of both. And uh, uh, I, many of you are also writing for our courses and you already have the experience of writing self-learning materials thus. And um, thus, um, uh, you know, reinforcing the learning with tasks, you know, reinforcing the theory, the, the discussion, the text uh, with tasks so that we can take the learners um, into confidence, you know, into the teaching of the whole material where the focus is from the learner's perspective was, um, was my thought for 
writing for the self learning materials for the cbcs thank you for listening uh, thank you ma'am for your talk and also now i invite all of you if you have any questions or comments or any kind of suggestion uh, please uh, unmute yourself and yes yes just unmute yourself and just raise your question please we have 10 minutes time for question and answer session for this please go ahead <clears throat> so if you have any question just unmute yourself and put your question here hello ah shatabdi please uh, good good afternoon ma'am ma'am actually uh, i want to know uh, in quality maxims how is it possible to avoid the sub maxims and and we can implement that in our interface uh, while we are uh, doing some webinars and seminars yeah for example if 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 i am taking a sentence if i if i may reply to shot of this question if i am taking a sentence i won't bore you with the details when you are talking about this in the in your presentation or if you are telling the phrase as far as i know these are very common phrases which we often find in our talks or maybe i am not absolutely sure when we are answering something so, so these are all maxim of quality okay so uh, thus it is assumed that the speaker's contribution to the conversation is true that ought to be true and they should not say what they believe to be false or they lack adequate evidence so these are all maxims of quality Uh, whereas if i say i won't bore you with all the these details this is maximum of quantity because uh, that states that the contribution should be as informative as is required for the purpose of the conversation and too little and too much should not be said so i hope i had answered your question shatabdi okay any more questions please Uh, could I make one? Could I make one? Co it's not a question. I want to know it from Shumana. Hello, do you get me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I'm not questioning you. I want to know from you this thing. I read a text, a part of the text written by Derrida, translated by Gayatri Spivak, on. discourse analysis there is one sentence i refer to uh, yes you come to my home consider this your own home how do you make the discourse analysis from this sentence i mean yeah i mean this is my home consider it your it's your own home stay here as long as you want yes how do you analyze this statement by the host addressed to a address addressed to a listener yeah um i would say that first of all um, there are two aspects from which i can um, analyze go for the analysis that is home home this is you have um, put in you have stressed on the um, diphthong of the of the word that is and the focus is on the word home and uh, not on um, come to my home not focus is not on the verb but focus is on the, on the word home because of your pronunciation maybe so as far as you could get it over my headphones so um, the speaker is probably asking the listener to be at at home at the person's home and uh, coming to the home is not important but being at home is important so this is what i could get so did i answer your question okay thank you very much thank you very much uh, do you have any more questions or any suggestions
I think I would uh, ask um, uh, somebody um, any questions on dialectology if any, anyone could ask. Um, okay. But, um, so, uh, sir, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, yes, sir, go ahead. Question, um, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, my question in dialectology over here is that you were speaking about uh, English having many different uh, pronunciation uh, as per region and um, other aspects, social aspects. Other uh, and many other aspects you spoke about. So does that mean that um, there is no wrong pronunciation to English? Uh, it depends. Those, okay. those who are putting question and those who are putting question, they need to introduce themselves. Okay, just uh, make a self introduction yes. and then put your question. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Zainif Fazarin. Uh, I'm presently uh, a first year MA ELT student. Uh, I'm a student of Shum Shumona Ma'am and um, I work as a uh, assistant professor in, uh, in an engineering college, Dream Institute of Technology. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Now, sir, Vasudev, uh, sir, can you please reply to her question? Okay, okay, okay. You are welcome. The question of wrong, right and wrong. If you pronounce, for example, a person who is used to speak in Cockney, I don't nothing. In standard British English, it is, I do not know anything. But if somebody says, I don't nothing, there is nothing wrong in it, in the context, in the perspective, in the context of Cockney language. After all, language is an effective tool of communication. So, if they try to communicate by deleting the copula, for example, a color guy in Texas usually deletes the copula. Do you think it's wrong? Not at all. It's, it is unacceptable to standard British English. This much I can tell you. This is not appropriate. For example, I tell you one example. In my class, in the class, I asked my teacher, Gretchen, could I come from the restroom? Then everybody started laughing in the class. And then when the laughing stopped, Gretchen told me, Hi, Basu, come on, come on. I went to a table. Basu, listen to me. You are not going, you are not coming to the guest room. I'm coming from the guest room. Restroom, I said. You are not coming. You are going to the restroom. You are not coming from the guest room. So this is an example of mother tongue interference. This is wrong, definitely not wrong, I, I devise. This is unacceptable to the context of American environment. Who are the talking? All the talkers are Americans. For example, if I say in the United States, fill in the application, they will say, Sir, you are, what are you talking about? Are you going to fill in the application? Fill up the application. So, in the American context, this expression, fill up the application, is appropriate, acceptable. But in India or in London, it is unacceptable. It is not a question of rightness or wrongness. It's a question of acceptance. It's a question of appropriateness. It's a question of time and place. In Cockney, in Northern Europe, in, if you go to the 
county, Yorkshire County. The Yorkshire County people say, I don't know nothing. What's wrong in that? They speak in that way. Because language, first of all, I tell you, language is an effective tool of communication. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. sir I have a question, sir. I'm, I'm oh, sorry, come on, uh, Okay, yes. this will be the last question. Okay, we are already. I'm Ajit Kumar Dev. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I am Ajit Kumar Dev, MAUT first year. <clears throat> yes, I'm, I have a question to uh, Professor Bash. Yes. So in his speech, I came to know that that is the variety of language. What? So, repeat. Repeat, please. From his speech, I came to know that dialect is a variety of language. So I have a question to him that is there any uh, difference between dialect and language? Yes, there is a difference. There is a difference. Uh, if, if there is, please uh, tell us some difference. There is a difference in the sense there are many dialects used by the people living in different regions of a land, of a country. And as that language has the spoken form of its own, their use, their mode of expression, their mode of articulation, their art of articulation is different. For example, uncle, U-N-C-L-E, uncle, uh, it is an example of the way I pronounce right at this moment. Uncle. Uncle is an example of idiolect. Because actually it should be pronounced as uncle. Dark lateral consonant should be used. Uncle. Uncle. Little. Battle. Rattle. If somebody says battle. If somebody says battle, he can have, he has every right to say battle. But because if the people of that community pronounce battle, or if it is his personal personal peculiarity, then it's all right. This is an example of idiolect, but as there was a Shortage of time, I couldn't explain all these things. So it, it, this is idiolect, and it depends whether it can be properly communicated or not. Because the primary purpose of language is to make the communication, to make communication. So language is for abstract. I want to learn Chinese language. There are many Chinese languages. For example, uh, the Chinese language of theology, Chinese language of code, Chinese language of uh, uh, journalism, Chinese language, Shanghai language, Chinese, Beijing Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. So they differ, they are dialects. And all these dialects are called in one word, that is language. So, sub, so these are the dialects, sub-languages. The language is one, that is Chinese. The language is one, that is English. <coughs> but there are many dialects. Anybody can use any dialect of his own choice, or of his own compulsion. I use the word, both the words choice and compulsion. I am not, I, I won't be able to understand even three sentences spoken by somebody in Cockney. And I don't say, I won't, I will never say that the man who speaks Cockney speaks wrong English. That's a dialect. But that dialect is also a part of English language. If somebody says living in Murshidabad, 
the nation they who come to calcutta for doing work in our houses they speak a particular variety of bengali language that is a dialect of bengali language believe me my son in law belongs to sileti district i don't understand sileti language or bangla language bengali language sir uh, thought we already uh, finished our time for this okay. session okay okay thank you thank you dr rali i am very much thankful to all of you it's a very encouraging uh this intercourse but i am not used to it this is the first time in <laughs> my life i, I get it's uh, fine this, i used this. so i am little bit shaky <clears throat> okay uh thank you sir uh, for your enlightening speech and also we are thankful to sumana ma'am now we have a tea break and we'll join again by uh, 2:45 okay uh, no uh, 2:45 245 okay okay 245 thank you will you join me thank you we'll join again by 5 please do it ask we have a uh, last session and that is technical okay. two session okay okay i'll be happy to be present uh, i will be very much happy to be present all along because this is the first time to me okay thank you
Sumona, ma'am, are you there? Sumona, ma'am. Yes. Sumona, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please, please join the session, ma'am. Please start the session. Thank you, Intaj. We'll, we will be starting technical session two shortly, where we have six speakers. I hope all the speakers are with us. The first speaker in the technical session two is Dr. C. Vijay Kumar. He is assistant professor in Bits Pilani and he will be talking on task design. Sir, please start your presentation. Uh, Ma'am, can we wait for a minute? Because I think more people are joining us in, in a minute. Yes, uh, maybe you can take one or two minutes more. Yeah. People are joining. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I request to just go through the chat because I have posted my abstracts for your uh, reading. Just take a look at it and that can help us to uh, relate what I share with you uh, in terms of, I mean, because we have only 10 minutes to wind up the session. It helps us just go through the chat and then take a look at the abstract I have shared with you all. Sir, you will have eight minutes. If you yeah, want ten I mean, minutes, you should start shortly. Uh, well, okay. Uh, let's not wait then for others, and let me just uh, take over. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, every one of you, and especially the people who have made presentations so far, because I'm going to generously take from their ideas and then relate to what I'm going to speak about task design. As you can see, my abstract shared with you, uh, whenever we think of a task-based teaching or tasks for language learners, whether it is for primary education or for secondary or high school or engineering, specialized education, we must keep in mind certain ideas related to a task. The first of all the ideas is that without a text, be it a spoken text that uh, Dr. Sumana has just talked about in her discourse analysis, or be it a text of a particular variety that Dr. Uh, Basudev talked about, or be it a text with literature background that others have mentioned, or even text that Professor Mohan Raj has mentioned about uh, graded readers and technical texts and register specific texts. So text is the crux here, around which we have to think about five different notions or ideas, which give us a sense of what kind of activities or tasks we can design for our students. The five aspects that we can think of is called language, learner, learning, teacher, and teaching. These are the five things that actually decide the uh, value of a task in the classroom. Now, of course, when we design tasks, they are of certain products. But when we administer those tasks in the classroom, the, the way they realize their meaning potential in the classroom, the way it is used by the student, that's a different idea altogether. So whenever we think of designing a task, we must first keep in mind these five ideas of language learner learning, teacher and teaching, in addition to a text that we need for the purpose of a task. The text provides us the communicative context in which the students will be functioning within those 10, 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So uh, let me take you to back to what Professor Mohan Raj, Professor Jay Shankar, Professor Basudev and Dr. Uh, uh, Sumana has just mentioned, they have used uh, uh, one particular uh, model that they were trying to talk about input tasks. In a way, Professor Mohan Raj's presentation focused on register analysis. Is what kind of a language that the students really need? Are they students at the primary level who need specific vocabulary that the texts have to be written within the range of, let's say, the first 500 frequently used words? so that they are simple and can be accessed by students? 
or are we talking about in Professor Jaishankar's terms texts where we have very good vocabulary with extraordinary collocations those collocations which otherwise are not found in general english or in spoken language that dr sumana at length talked about or are we talking about the varieties that professor uh, basudev mentioned about uh, london variety or indian english or new zealand english so what is it that we want our students to be exposed to what's the input nature that we want our students is it a business text is it the text that the engineering students read on a daily basis or is it that a journalistic student wants to learn the media of writing journalism so i should i take an open ed article from a newspaper what is the text and this text will give us the guidance as to what we should do with the text and as i have mentioned in the uh, synopsis that i have shared with you here comes the main topic of it once you have the text it's always possible for you to classify the text let me just go back to the presentations that we have just listened to professor mohan raj sir's presentation uh, focused on classification so his presentation was mainly on five different themes he organized his talk into five phases so is the lecture let's say for example i want to teach my students how to listen to a lecture online that's the focus or the objective of the lesson now what kind of a listening is it is it organized into phases or is it chronologically developed starting from 1500 bc into the history of english language to the present day how it is used chronologically or is it organized in terms of a problem and solution or is it organized in terms of ideas that dr sumana uh, made a presentation on discourse analysis her presentation is organized uh, in terms of three different typical structures in discourse analysis contextualization followed by exemplification followed by explanation full stop next idea contextualization exemplification and explanation so this is the typical structure of different lectures that people follow so if i want my students to understand how a lecture is delivered online first of all i need to know what kind of lectures so especially professor basudev's presentation used certain terms like diachronic synchronic uh, etymological meaning and uh, uh, dialects evolutionary evolution of language these are technical terms for someone maybe not easy for someone to understand so now i can think of a pre task of reading or listening maybe i can think of vocabulary ideas where i'll introduce my students to uh, these terms so probably if you are my audience i would say okay now go to a to z of elt of scott dunbury's website and just explore these terms i am throwing here five terms and then find out how these terms mean in that particular website which provides definitions of these terms what do you mean by diachronic what do you mean by synchronic what do you mean by asynchronous all these terms that you can use uh, in in this. so the first task i can give my students is this this is called the sense of possibility the moment i understand that my students really need the knowledge of the technical register before they actually understand the lecture i am chunking my talk or my activities into phases pre task while doing the task actual listening and after the listen will they just be left or will they have to do any activity or probably they may be asked as somebody rightly mentioned maybe they will be asked to write a summary of what they did listen to in the talk or they have to come up with a Uh, a network of how something is this term the lecture instead of writing complete sentences your action task is going to be select some key phrases and put them there and then you can ask students to check whether the phrases that one person has written are the same as the other person has written. let them discuss what the outcome of their understanding is this is called the post task so task design is not necessarily something that you find in terms of texts followed by a rigid framework but rather so 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 if i may intervene you have one minute one more minute yeah i'm i'm winding up that's what i'm doing so if you take what professor mohan raj sir has mentioned teachers of possibility the design and use of tasks is all in the hands of the teachers we can design tasks right there but all we need to design a task is a text and the way we contextualize those texts 
in terms of pre-tasks, while task, and post-task using certain functions or genres that I have mentioned in the abstract will make sense as far as task design is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our second speaker is Dr. Shuprat Sarkar. He is Associate Professor from Rishi Bhokhim Chandra College, Naihati, West Bengal. And he will be talking on English pronunciation in the 21st century. Sir, you have exactly eight minutes time. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Honorable Professor S. Mohan Raj. Honorable Professor Vashudev Chakravarti, Honorable Professor Joy Shankar Bosch, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Honorable Professor Manan Kumar Mondal, Director, School of Humanities, Professor Shumana Bandhubadhyay, Professor Inthaya Jali, and all the fellow presenters and the participants. The topic for my presentation today is Variations in English Pronunciation in the 21st Century. I shall be speaking what uh, Professor Vashudev Chakravarti, my honorable teacher, has already spoken. I will be just making a structure of that. In the context of 21st century, variations in English pronunciation have increased with the expansion of English as a global language and the dominant language of computer and internet and web technologies. The use of English has increased and variations of pronunciation multiplied. All English speaking people do not speak the same English and such variations in pronunciation are becoming more audible. Nowadays, such vari varieties of English are rampant. English movies made in America or Hong Kong are now being subtitled in English for the understanding of audience across the globe. Such variations are more common because of the use of English as a first language, second language, or as a foreign language. The interference of mother tongue, especially in pronunciation, is widespread. Among the users of English in India, there are several regional variations in pronunciation. And we find that every square mile, we have a new variety of English spoken in India. Types of variations, as Professor Chakraborty has already spoken about, such variations in pronunciation can be studied through diachronic or through synchronic study. Through a diachronic or historical analysis, one can study the ever-changing nature of spoken English and the evolution of English. Through a synchronic study, one can record and analyze such varieties of pronunciation in the present context. Such synchronic varieties or variations can be, number one, regional, dialectal, social, individual. Such synchronic variations may be based on the field of discourse, manner of discourse, and mode or medium of discourse. Such variations in pronunciation may also depend on the age, and relationship of the users of the same language. We have different variations in even British English. One variety of English pronunciation has traditionally been dominant and popular among the privileged sections of the population in Great Britain called RP or received pronunciation. This variety of English has been regarded with high esteem by the users as well as by those who do not speak it. This prestige accent has long been associated with the educated elite and urban population of England. This type of English is variously referred to as Oxford English, BBC English, and even the Queen's English. However, nowadays in the 21st century, the educated class speech or their speech at large throughout the Anglophonic world displays considerable regional variations. The term non-regional pronunciation or NRP with a large range of variations is now commonly used to represent pronunciation, which cannot be pinned down to a specific area. Phoneticians do not prefer any form of graded inequality with reference to pronunciation. And instead of RP, they use the same term standard Southern British English or SSBE. There are of course several types of accents in English in addition to those of RP or British English. Such variations in pronunciation are sometimes put under the label of colloquialism, vulgarisms, and, or provincialisms. Variations in pronunciation are found among users based on their dialects and their that are local, territorial, rural, even urban on the micro level and regional on the macro level. So we have such varieties of 
English or Englishes in India. English has been primarily used as a language for trade and commerce. English language gradually became the language of judiciary, administration, education in India. Wherever the English colonists settled, they created a communicative functional English for serving their business and imperial purposes by mixing the local languages with English phonology, lexis or syntax. New variations in pronunciation developed through the process of pidginization and in a later stage through a process of creolization. The effect of prolonged linguistic hybridity and assimilation of different languages promoted newer forms of spoken English in these presidencies. Uniformity in pronunciation could not be achieved because of the mother tongue interference and the superior phonological power of regional languages of India like Marathi, Gujarati, Urdu, Tamil, Hindi, Bengali, etc. Languages with more than 50 phonemes each could not be appropriated to English language with just 44 RP phonemes. The variations in pronunciation that are audible even after three centuries have created a phenomenon called general Indian English and various hybrid forms of spoken English like Tamilish, Kinglish, Benglish, etc. have commonly been accepted as Indian Englishes. As Professor T. Bala Subramaniam has once noted that the most educated Indians who speak English did not learn it from an RP speaker and that most Indians who learn English learn their own Indian language before they are exposed to English. Thus, we have different varieties of English, Englishes in India. With the expansion of internet access and development of online app-based activities, there has been a tendency towards standardization of Indian English. Regional variations are gradually being absorbed by the dominant urban English in India. That is, of course, also elitist. In America also, we have Englishes, new Englishes. English is used as a first language in North America, US and Canada. Even in Australia, Australasia, Australia and New Zealand, along with several Commonwealth states all over the world. The European colonization of North America left linguistic imprints of major European languages in the United States. Over the course of over 300 years, a different variety of pronunciation of English developed through the entire subcontinent, which is nowadays referred to as General American or GA English. The variations in pronunciation can be seen as an amalgamation speech pattern of the Northeastern USA. The spoken forms of English of the Middle East or Middle West of America, Southern states of the USA, East Coast cities such as New York and Boston are not similar. As Professor Chakraborty has pointed out, there are definitely regional variations in pronunciation among the users of American English. Differences are marked according. Sorry, if I may intervene. Sorry, if I may intervene. You know, okay, thank you. Right? Yes, I will wind up. Differences are marked according to the dialect, socialects, and regional variations. Similarly, Canadian English also have such variations. Even in case of international English, we have Latin America, Japan, China, Philippines. They have a tendency towards using general American English. In Ireland, Scotland, Wales, we have little number of RP speakers as such. Artificial American type of pronunciation has evolved to the Hollywood movies. The same accent pattern was copied in the Anglophonic cinema across the world and made that variation more popular. In the 21st century, the pure form of British or English RP is a minority form. Most English today is spoken outside the British Islands. In the USA, more than 220 million people use English as their first language. It is used as the first language in several other countries. So we have such variations like American English, Australian English, Indian English, Singaporean English, Caribbean English, Russian English, and finally the international English that we use in the knowledge process outsourcing centers. Thus to conclude, I would say that with the expansive networking and globalization, the form of electronic verbal communication has also been affected. Several varieties of English which are now of global significance are those used in different platforms of web technologies within the context of multilingual speech communities using English as a lingua franca, the growth of a more flexible functional communicative English is visible. Even in localities like New Zealand, new Englishes have grown. So it is now convenient to use the form of English for international communication. This common ground has to be accepted, especially in multilingual, multilinguistic societies like India that uses English mainly as a second language. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suprat. Our next speaker is Mr. Dubadam Dutto. He is from Karimpur, Nadia, West Bengal. And 
he will be speaking on english education after independence hello sir are you there please uh, turn on your mic Yes, yes, sir. Can you can you listen to? Yes, sir. You are audible okay. now. Good afternoon, all my friends, and welcome to this session. Uh, today I am talking about English education after independence. Actually, this is a topic on which some million pages. have been written and the discussion would continue because this is an unending process of going through modification and changes when india won freedom that was absolutely no goal to reach and only 14% or so were illiterate so it was a huge task to meet the demand for education from all corners and the topic that i am covering here can not be covered in a single discussion i am just talking about some aspects that is the government appointed commissions and committees they get recommendations the government framed policies and all these brought about some structural changes in in education as well as some change of teaching some change in textbooks and change in evaluation system after a series of changes we find that many things have changed since independence in 1948 the university commission was set up and it suggested a federal language to be developed to replace english but what happened because of the limitation of federal language english continued to enjoy its status although it was not taken up as media of instruction in all all subjects it was in higher education that english retained its position after that when the constitution of india was taken up it gave hindi the status of national or official language but does it hinder the status of english not not at all it was decided that english should continue as an associate official language of interstate communication language of the court language of the law language of the offices and parliament so english retained its position after that the government thought of bringing about a modification in secondary education that's why mudaliya commission was set up Mudaliya Commission recommended that mother tongue should be the medium of instruction at middle school stage. Two languages have to be taught at HS and uh, high school and HS stage. At least two languages should be taught. But one thing that is very significant today that Mudaliya Commission uh, laid emphasis on diploma in ELT. 
and also modification of textbooks. And here lies the importance of English language teaching as a discipline in India. Later, Education Commission was set up in 1964. It published its report in 1966. It recommended a modified version of three language formula uh, at the lower primary stage, one language, that is mother tongue, and mother tongue as medium of instruction. At a higher primary stage, two languages, mother tongue or the regional language. At lower secondary stage, three languages. And at higher secondary stage, that is 11, 12, only two languages. Actually, this, is, this commission is also known as Kothari Commission. And we are following today is, whatever we are following is a continuation of the recommendations of the Kotari Commission. Kotari Commission held the view that English should continue a high status as long as it remains the principal medium of education at university stage. Teaching of English should begin in class 5. Structural approach to teaching be introduced. And one thing very important, that is English to be taught not as a content subject and not for uh, teaching or studying literature, but for development of language skills. Uh, after this, a series of changes took place in India. Kotari Commission found its actual implementation in National Policy on Education and Program of Action. And a series of changes took place from 1968 to 94. The recommendation actually became fruitful. So if I may intervene, if I may intervene, you have one minute time. Oh. But the scenario in Bengal, we have to look. In 1981, uh, English was abolished from primary education following the recommendations of Imam Shubhimal Mujumdar Committee. In 1994, in 1994 English began to be taught in class 5 following the report of Ashok Mitra Commission. Following the report of the Pobitra Sarkar Committee, English was introduced from the second half of class 2. And in 2004, switching away from the recommendations of the Ranju Gopal Mukhopadhyay Committee, English was introduced in class 1. And later, it is to be pointed out that National Kali Park 2005 brought about a massive change. It admits the public demand for English, looks upon English as a window to the world, and English is perceived to open up opportunities. It suggests input-rich methodology, that is the whole language, the task-based, comprehensible input, and many other aspects. Its focus was on teaching language in meaningful context. It also uh, spoke of maximum exposure to English. Children's life at school must be linked to their life outside the school. That was their motto. And that's why textbooks all over India underwent a radical change. And because of this change, in methodology, in textbooks, there was also a change in evaluation. Examination was replaced by comprehensive, continuous evaluation. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Dr. Shadun De. He is from RCCIIT, Kolkata, and he will be talking on morphology. Sir, you have eight minutes time. Please, over to you, sir. 
Sir, we are not getting your audio. Due to... Hello? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are now. Yes, sir, you are now. Am I audible to you? Audible? Okay. Okay. Here among the stalwarts, like the most uh, large number uh, of professors from Kundal University. Yes, sir. sir I, I one minute, uh, one minute, sir. You have yes. a network problem, yes. so you just off your video and just give your lecture on audio mode. Okay, okay. Because your I'm doing that. Internet is poor, sir. Okay. Off your video and uh, uh, go ahead with audio. Okay, okay. Am I audible right now? <clears throat> yes, sir. Fine. I, I made the video off. Am I audible? Hello? Yes. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, the contention of this particular speech. Like all other modern languages, English language is is so a product of dynamic process of morphological construction. I think the professors who have given deliberations today. They have all taken help somehow of morphological structure. Because mainly morphology in English, it I have focused on especially the relationship with other foreign words and the roots where from English actually has emerged. I think uh, from the morning today, we have uh, got to listen so many lectures on uh, different dialects, sociolect, duolect. These are morphological constructions. And uh, right now, the focus of my work on two phases, the first phase that I have introduced the general introduction about morphology and its construction. And I have also referred to the morphological constructions in day-to-day -day basis that we use in English. And at the same point, we have referred to the interactions in between the morphological structures that we make for our socio-economic and political interaction as well as our educational interaction. The focus is on technical side that of how we would be useful to the veterans as well as to the new ones who are in focus. The actual message that I have referred to over here we, while working on this morphology, I got ample ideas from different sources relating to this particular morphology and whenever i have referred to i have just made few changes uh, on the basis of the structures that actually were provided by honorable editors of the series where i want to focus on derivational prefixes and suffixes as well as inflectional suffixes. So what actually was my contention with this particular work, which is highly, I know, giving me ample satisfaction to work for the learners of ELT as well as for the experts in this particular group.
So we have missed you somewhere. So, uh, how, how can we get your voice? In touch? You have four more minutes. Okay, shall we move on to our next speaker? Thank you, sir. We have lost you. Lost your voice. We'll come back to you. We'll get back to you. Uh, so we move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker in the session is Mr. Shoibal Chatterjee. He is assistant professor from NSH in Kolkata. And he will be talking on teaching writing, the process approach. Over to you, Shoibal. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Professor Sumana Mandopadhyay, Professor Ali, Honorable Mohanraj Sir, Honorable Vasudev Chakravarti Sir, Honorable Joy Shankar Goswami Sir, Manun Sir, the other esteemed academics in the session, and my co-presenters. Well, my topic is the process approach to teaching writing. I'll just share a PPT. Please let me know if my PPT is visible. Yes, sir. Is it visible? Yeah, make it full screen, uh, sir. Is it visible now? Full screen? Yeah, fine. Fine, Thank sir. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, the process approach to teaching writing. Well, over the years, uh, we teachers, the, uh, the researchers, we have all experimented with different approaches to teaching writing as to which would be the best approach that can be adopted. One of the various approaches is the process approach. But before we come to the process approach, we need to understand what are the various approaches that have been experimented with or are or, or have been practiced or, or are being practiced in uh, various regions, in schools, at various levels. One such approach is the controlled to free writing approach, which basically focuses on the grammatical competency. What happens in this approach? We just give paragraphs, we give sentences, and learners are made to just make certain alterations. So what is happening, the practice is restricted. They are made to ch make certain changes, like uh, statements, statements to questions, questions to statements. This kind of changes are only allowed, and they are not allowed to go beyond this. Then paragraphs are given. They are made to make alterations in the paragraph. So restrictions are imposed. Next is, of course, free writing. There is some sort of freedom, but here it is the randomized you know noting of points that comes to the mind once the topic is introduced to the learners they are allowed or they are made to note down certain points randomly here the uh, focus is not on the grammatical competency not on the form at all but the uh, quantity of ideas quantity of writing is encouraged next is the paragraph pattern approach now this is the most common approach that is followed that is where uh, the model paragraphs are given, students are made to see, learners are made to see, and they are made to just copy and replicate and imitate. The focus is more on, again, imitation. Then there is grammar, syntax, uh, organization approach. Here again, uh, the, uh, the, the, the contention behind this is that the grammar practice, the structural part, and the organization of the uh, the write-up should go together. But again, it is very, very restricted. Not much freedom is given. Communicative approach, okay, which is, of course, we all know, the communicative language teaching approach has been in the recent, uh, in the recent practice. And it has also, uh, you know, it has also uh, stepped into the areas of teaching writing. So here, the focus is on the 
the the conveying of messages to the reader we while writing the learner should think of the reader and whether it is being effectively conveyed okay and then came the process approach we'll come to the various aspects of the process approach but i would like i would like to highlight here with all the previous approaches what was the case task is being introduced learners working then the role of the teacher is again coming at the end wherein the, wherein they work with the end finished product now researchers and teachers have over the years they have now they have shifted from this uh, you know this end product you know product approach the end approach and have reiterated that we as teachers need to be very much involved and active right from the beginning of the writing session and this was this has been labeled as the process approach because writing goes through certain processes what are these processes we will see in the next slide but the important thing is teachers as the learners get involved in the process we as teachers need to get involved in the in each of these processes now let's see what are the different aspects of the process approach now this is a model that has been uh, uh, conceived and presented by ron white and valery arns okay which were very clearly uh, you know explains the process now what is their model what is their idea the process approach is nothing but a set of recursive stages means let's begin with this one generating ideas at the bottom the process should begin the learner should begin with the process of generating ideas once the topic is given whatever is the topic they need to think the point the points should be noted down like in free writing they were doing similarly here they need to first think they need not start writing at the beginning you see dra drafting is at the later stage so first is noting randomly noting down points whatever ideas are coming then the next step is structuring means again say organizing it is not yet writing has not started it is organizing mentally maybe i will put this point first i'll put this point second this will come at the end so the structuring goes on yes some sort of you know grammatical structures will also come because it goes you know simultaneously at the back of the mind the grammar concern is there with everybody but writing has not started writing now comes in the drafting stage which is the first draft here the actual writing starts where the ideas and the struct whatever the structure mental organization has been trained are putting put into and then focusing now my for so after the first draft has been written my task has not ended means the learner's task has not ended uh, he has to now focus on it. focus in means whether assessing whether it is it matches the expectations of the reader have i conveyed whatever message i want to with effect what i wanted to with the desired effect so these focus these are the points of focus then he comes to evaluate of course grammatical evaluation syntactic evaluation semantic evaluation content evaluation all sorts of evaluation needs to be done it has not even ended again so reviewing comes so one minute time I'll, I'll wrap up. so next is reviewing so it is at the center so again so reviewing and starts and here we need to actually develop this subspace so i'll come to the role of the teacher very quickly so reviewing means again going to the ideas if i have missed out on some ideas if my structuring and organization has gone wrong sequencing has gone wrong i need to think of that i have to focus again if the message has not been actually perfectly conveyed i need to think on that and again i need to redraft it so this goes on for first round second round third round okay so this is the process approach one after another now uh, these concepts uh, need to be applied this is a theory unless it is applied it has no value so what am i supposed to do and how can i apply it at the classroom level in brief i'll just touch upon certain points so what is my role what should i do first is facilitating the brainstorming session that is generating ideas which will generate i will facilitate i will form small small groups i'll engage them in small discussions so that ideas are generated they note down the ideas 
my next role would uh, would be providing cues in need that would lead to an idea sometimes they would be missing out on certain points i will not keep the idea i will do some scaffolding or maybe i'll provide some cues that will lead to the idea that is missing in the content and here i think uh, the uh, the role the, the crucial aspect of uh, what mohan raj sir you know uh, highlighted in the morning is what enes prabhu had uh, is the plausibility had you know conceived is the plausibility factor so considering the needs they will need our support in terms of some ideas some cues they will need then they will move on to rough draft my role is simple here to monitor that they are they are drafting i will provide the language support in need definitely there will be they will be requiring it depends on the competency of the group they will definitely require some support i'll give some support next is conferencing now this has uh, this is a term has, which has been uh, proposed by david newlan he is in favor of conferencing means the uh, the learners may share their rough draft with the teacher it is not submission it is just sharing for further improvement they can do the same with the the peer members also so conferencing so i might be required help in the conferencing stage and this crucial role of course the next part is developing the soft skills of reviewing and editing constantly encouraging them go through the write up see what is the wrong what is wrong uh, you know any any alterations need to be made edit so developing the editing skills reviewing skills this habit needs to be grown written first draft cannot be the final draft it has to be written so again mon i am monitoring the redrafting stage the final drafting stage and then publishing publishing here means either submission if it is a class work or publishing it can go to the school wall magazine or the college wall magazine whatever okay and then uh, my my role is again uh, you know giving a follow up task or adopting certain skill integration strategies the last two points are can also be practiced with any approach it is not exclusive to the process approach so this is in brief the uh, the process approach to teaching writing and how am i supposed to actually implement in the classroom with whatever kind of writing it so thank you madam and thank you thanks to everybody it has been a, a you know matter of great privilege to deliver a presentation on, on this platform thank you very much over to you madam thank you shoiban thank you i'll stop sharing our last speaker our last speaker um, in the session is ms swati basu and she is from bharatiya vidyabhavan institute of management science kolkata she will be speaking on language and its function uh, you have exactly 8 minutes time over to you shakti uh, thank you ma'am uh, so in that case if you can stop presenting i would like to present the ppt uh the screen still shows uh, shoibal sir is pre presenting no i think i think i've stopped uh, i've stopped presenting uh is my is my screen still visible uh, oh, yes i could not see any okay uh it is still shoibal sir can you see uh, once again if your ppt is still on uh, i'll just check <clears throat> uh, i think i have stopped sharing i'm just going to uh check please once again i'll share Sorry, my screen once more uh, let me uh, let me do one thing no. let me share my screen once more and i'll stop it again <clears throat> so okay is, then go ahead. let me see so this is how i have shared my screen so now i am this i have actually closed the ppt now i am stopping share let me see hmm. now swati ma'am can you please try
Dr. Intas, can you please Sorry, share the screen? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. But uh, yeah, I, uh, okay, can you please, please share the screen once again? If, I can share, but if you try once again, if it's not coming, then I'll share. Yeah, it, it came. <clears throat> Okay. Good afternoon, everyone present. It is the most moment for me to teachers and the senior wizards in the domain, alongside the esteemed participants. Uh, thank you to the organizing team of NSOU. The is language functions. As there is constraint of time, I'll quickly flick through the my understandings on the scene. Now, when I Use the word language, it is not restricted alone. Language in general. Now, what is language? Perhaps this is an uh, age old inquisitive question. For example, when we feel a chair, or we can feel a chair or a table, but can we say language is also a physical entity like a book or a chair? We cannot. Then, what is language? It has been referred as a system of abstractions. It has many elements embedded in it that are interrelated and they function through our sense organs. Conceptually, language as a whole is a coalescence of what and how. That is the lang and the parole part. In which the part has the linguistic and 50% of facial expression. So it's making a total of 93% contribution as pointed out by Professor Albert Meherabian. Now this English, Bengali, Telugu, Tamil, Hindi, and so on, these are the different labels that are used to refer uh, to these abstract systems. If we take a look at the exhibit, Do It, it appears to be a pair of lexical items arranged in accordance to the syntactical system in an abstract system called English language. And that is what part, that is the content part. Next, what is the purpose of using the language? It is then we understand how to use it, and we can say language starts functioning in terms of actual utterances or uh, the way it is written. Language functions to the various ways of using it. Like uh, we can say, uh, let me do it, or would you mind me doing it, or get it done immediately. So herein lies the functional part, that is how to express it. May it be in our daily communication or literary works. Now, it needs to be understood that there are certain factors that determine the usage. The prime of those factors is the society. The society is in because language functions in a society, for a society, and by a society. The socio-economic or the political and the cultural scaffolding are the indicators of its manifestations. And uh, these are all variables. And uh, at the base of language learning is psychology. Language existed in the prehistoric society and it still exists in our society, which we call the digital age. But of course, uh, WhatsApp and LinkedIn languages did not exist at that point of time. But does that indicate that there is no relation between the societies through ages? The changes in the environment and the growing needs of the former give birth to the latter. And it will continue to be so. That is why we are still trying to know more of the origin of human language. Now, the, there is another factor which uh, my senior experts have already mentioned, that is the context. Language is context-bound. If we take a look at the exhibit on Crossroad, you find the ambulance is there, the truck is there, or the private cars, they all exist. They all exist in the same society, but they cannot varied contexts in which language functions. For example, uh, even now, right at the moment, language is functioning in the context of uh, sharing our ideas, which is happening uh, because of the online seminar at a point of time. And additionally, this context can be global or it can be localized, just as the time frame could be specific and societal as well. So context would again vary in terms of urban or rural setup. 
today when we are interacting with each other within a scheduled time simultaneously this is happening uh, this online seminar is happening instead of a regular offline mode the because of the pandemic crisis and a global time frame and a global context as well so this time frame and the context is very important as we have already mentioned that language cannot exist outside the society so that acceptance from the society is also a very crucial point moving on to my last uh, section moving on to my last section interpretation of language is of the essence so long we have been talking about the language use in terms of uh, in terms of encoding but uh, how could objectives be complete without our expected outcomes similarly language cannot function without the interpretation uh, you see language functions because of its interpretations only first human languages were communicated and uh, you can say or it were interpreted so it were interpreted by imitation of the sounds that existed uh um, in the nature in and around in the environment as is evident from max muller's bow wow theory in fact we are still doing so when we experience the therapeutic effect of music it is sound and its modulation the intonations that soothes us the doctor soothes us because of the tonal uh, quality that he or she delivers while interacting with us so this is sound and language in a natural if we can put it in this way is a skilled and a careful maneuver careful maneuver of sounds in an abstract system that functions uh, within a context and a time frame finally uh, uh, the fact that remains is how the sound is to be interpreted or the images that appear to us for example if you take a look at the glass uh we can say the glass is yet to be filled by water to the brim or it is half empty or even we can say half filled with water and half by air so it is upon the reader to decode and decipher because it is interpretation that gives language its meaning so let us skip exploring sounds images signs and symbols and at the same time expressions to an effective uh, uh end or use it in an effective way meaningful way and obviously as accepted by the society because societal acceptance is also very important because these are all society political uh, uh, political acceptance then socio economic factors these are all the uh, the par- the yardsticks the parameters that define a language so with this i wind up and uh, th- thank and ex- express my thanks as sent to everyone here and with this i rest my submission thank you over to you uh, ma'am thank you shati we have finally finished off with the individual presentations and if for the interactive session we have the question and answer session now which would be or which will be there from i think it is uh, 3:45 so we have 5 minutes we should begin from 3:45 and we can we encourage you to ask questions we will also take questions from the chat box if you have questions you can ask directly not only actually we have a deep question if, if if any participant is like to uh, say something regarding all these things uh, they can uh, be allowed for one or two minutes also not only the questions okay. very true anything anything any participant can comment do their suggestion or anything what they have learned or what they have share anything they can say. yes madam i am ajit kumar de i would ask a question as a teacher should i 
teach our children grammar or vocabulary hello you are we addressing this question hello yes yeah. without vocabulary possibly we can teach grammar you are supposed to mediate grammar through the help of words and vocabulary so you begin with a for apple and you don't begin with what is a simple sentence what is a compound sentence or what is a complex sentence what is morphology what is syntax all these things come after that once you are familiar with the letters alphabets and the sounds that is phonemes morphemes and then you pass on to morphology the study of word, word formation syntax the study of structuring morphemes and words into a meaningful unit and a part of which that i discussed today and the discussion was obviously incomplete for the uh, for the shortage of time mm, that's collocation it's like brick laying and you are supposed to be a mason and you are building a Uh, uh, an edifice out of brick laying and the bricks are the words without the bricks no machinery is possible all language constructs are works of machinery so without words uh, if i cut macnees there is no go we will be stuck into the mud of tongue tied silence okay is it clear but single individual word is not important sir i have single i have one more question is not dictionary word is not important to teach you have to teach word in a context in a set of relationship that relationship is called collocation no word is meaningful without a set of relationship therefore you have to drive home the point of vocabulary to a prospective learner in his or her childhood in a set of relationship sir vocabulary means only to memorize words or something else no that is that is not a productive effective pedagogy or tool of teaching you cannot cram words from a dictionary that you will soon forget you have to correlate a word you have to make a word pick a word as a referent to an object or to an idea all words are by referential they refer to itself they refer to something outside itself that by referentiality makes the word meaningful to the prospective child learner so we have to pick words from a context of its use not from the pages of a dry dictionary i think i am clear okay thank you sir uh hello sir uh audible sir can i have a question please yeah. hello me okay you are welcome can i have a the thing is that i i i want to please share introduce, with, uh, please introduce yourself first and then ask uh, yeah uh, good afternoon everybody this is dilip das and uh, ex indian air force engineer right now i'm i have been uh, uh, teaching for 10 years english language in a, a private institute here in phoenix at malda district i have passed my pg elt from the same university with sumana ma'am uh, can remember me 
I have some practical experience while going through uh, the teaching of my language to various uh, level of learners, starting from the uh, uh, higher secondary to college levels and and more ahead. So I have been teaching uh, the students, but everything I could manage on the basis of the uh, what is called as the word structure, the structure, grammar, word stock, and everything. But one uh, very big problem, whatever I am facing in the classroom situation, is that fear of speaking English language. especially for the learners of bengali medium so can i have a uh, good uh, guidance from your end from all of the good expert people from here that how can i deal with the situation where people are mostly fearing to speak english fear of speaking english not uh, they are not fearing uh, to speak hindi though that is also their second language it's not in their mother tongue but in case of english it's concerned they are facing a lot of problems of fear in their mind that's my question i can give you an answer from the psychological point of view it's a psychosis it's a fear psychosis about english and it comes down from our collective consciousness if i put it in the words of karl jung collective consciousness of a colonialized nation we have consciously or unconsciously imbibed the impression that english is the language of a superior white culture the when we confront the problem of communicating via english through english unconsciously or subconsciously or consciously we are subject to that fear psychosis that this is the realm this is the culture linguistic culture of a superior white colonist or colonizer and i am a subject this is uh, a psychic fixation this is one part of the question the other part of the answer that comes to my mind is that uh, this is vernacular interference hang that kind of hang is working in our mind vernacular or mother tongue interference hang that works in the mind of one facing the problem of speaking in english and in this uh, professor mohan raj will throw some mm -hmm. insightful light i am expecting an incisive analysis of this question from professor mohan raj is the most competent person <laughs> thank you uh, thank you dr basu uh, i think you have covered most of the points one one is you have covered the psychological aspect of it uh, there are also other uh, reasons um, one is as you rightly said it's a question of confidence we are using a language which is not ours see with hindi it happens that there are many more people around us who speak it so we feel uh, fairly confident or we feel that okay they are our own people but when it comes to english we are always conscious that somebody is observing us and this sense or this uh, feeling of awareness that somebody else is uh, observing us and perhaps will find what we are saying is wrong that fear makes us uh, uh, diffident to use english okay so in fact uh, many linguists say the best way to learn language is for, to become shameless if one becomes shameless only then one can learn language which means one has to start using the language whether or not it is correct because our language has a quality called auto correction means mm -hmm. i use language today i make certain errors 
but I am not worried that what I have said is wrong. I continue to use the language and I get exposed to more language use. I'm quite receptive to the language inputs I get. And with these inputs that I get, fresh inputs I get, the previous error that I made gets corrected on its own. This is this is the linguistic explanation that is given by uh, several people. So the, uh, the fear that we have is largely because it's a language that somebody else uh, is observing us and somebody else is likely to point out our error, that fear is what makes us feel diffident. Whereas we don't feel that in with Hindi or any other Indian language that we might uh, speak. This is this is my observation. So can uh, I I'd share? Like to... from... Hello? 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 Yes. Uh, it's audible. Go Hello, uh, I, I'm Otano Mondol. I was a student of PGELT under NSOU from the year 2015 to 2017. Uh, uh, I have a question to Soiral sir uh, about uh, the process of writing. Uh, there, my question is Sir explained everything. My doubt is that can feedback be a uh, part of that process? That is, on some particular writing some product uh, if some feedback is uh, received and depending on that feedback it is again corrected can feedback may be taken as a part of that process thank you sir uh, well at what stage you are taking the feedback that is important say for example i have already highlighted the conferencing part in stage 3 that is also a kind of feedback means intermediary feedback yes of course learners uh, have written their first draft they want to share i am encouraging that sharing i am getting feedback i am giving necessary suggestions if not direct corrections direct direct error corrections i am giving necessary suggestions for improvement so i am working on a feedback Again, uh, say, for example, at the end, definitely, when the final drafts are being submitted, that is, again, their write-ups are itself a kind of, you know, uh, the product on which I can deliver the teacher's feedback. Uh, the, feedbacks, the feedback can be given orally, can be noted down, can be given as comments, which the learners can use in the subsequent sessions. Um, so definitely uh, feedback can be used. Uh, Saibal, that's, uh, no, that's just one point that Thank I have you. to say. The feedback that we give has to be very constructive. It's not simply saying something is wrong or something is right. But if something is wrong, how it can become better in a very encouraging way. Because yes. that's also part of process writing. Okay, so yes, you yes. don't end with one draft. When you offer feedback, that feedback should help the learner to make a second draft, third draft, etc. That's yeah. That's yes. that's where the feedback works. Uh, I'd like to thank you. To thank you very much. I'd like to add to Atanu Mandal's question on the feedback part. One of the uh, strategies that seems to have uh, a lasting effect on students is a one-to-one -one, uh, interactive sessions uh, organized by teachers. Uh, for instance, uh, instead of writing it down on a piece of paper and giving it to the student, uh, we can have the student in, in our office where we want the student to realize what his uh, writing is like, what the style of writing or the conventions of writing that he seems to have an issue with. So once he himself points out the mistakes, and then if you if you encourage him to speak out how he, he can work on those concerns, uh, that will make a lasting impact. Uh, as as Professor Mohan said, said uh, you know, constructive feedback in this context is like making the student realize what he is not able to do at this point of time. Uh, that can help them a lot with their uh, writing. I think so. Yeah, uh, Vijay. The only problem is. 
uh, we are con discussing ODL materials. Uh, what you have said is uh, absolutely applicable in conventional teaching where I have my students in my class, etc. But in ODL, most of the writing and the feedback that we give is either online or uh, through distance. In that sense, I was, I think that that was one of the things that uh, Saibal was uh, thinking of probably. But your, your point is well taken. Uh, well, yes. That's true. One to one. Face-to-face uh, -face feedback is excellent, but uh, we are making a compromise in uh, distance learning. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bhaskar. Yes, sir. He's saying something. Sorry, we can you. Yes, Orpita, can go ahead, please. Orpita. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello? Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. You are. You are having also some problem with the mic. You're not audible. Are you speaking? Hello? Yeah, now you are better. Yeah. It's better. Um, actually, uh, actually, I have a question. Ki, uh, whenever I used to teach the students in my uh, classroom, especially in the language lab, there are certain problems I used to face over there. Especially, you know, uh, because these people, these students are coming from uh, the vernacular medium and they're coming from uh, Hindi medium students. They're Hindi medium students. So, uh, well, actually, I used to face the problem is that they never used to sp uh, speak properly. The, their assent is also not clear and uh, they are always afraid of uh, speaking. Even I had a complaint from the director also that uh, their, their performance are not good in the interview. In the interview. Because uh, they are they are being continuously rejecting due to their um, vocabulary. So uh, can I get some suggestion from you how to tackle with this problem? I don't know. Uh, uh, if I can respond to this question. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think you are the best person, Vijay, from technology. Uh, since uh, I mean I have handled language lab sessions. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult. The moment the students are in a particular environment called language lab, they are already scared. They think that the the you know there are they are supposed to cope with a lot of things in the language lab. So some of the ideas that are I mean Professor Mohan Raj in his presentation mentioned very clearly that register specific interview is a kind of a register. It's a kind of a context. It's a situation in which the people are supposed to respond to a particular questions. So it's primarily about how somebody responds to a set of questions. This is the uh, genre that we have to work on, how someone can respond to questions. So as I mentioned in my chat box a little while ago for some question on um, by, by Billy Das, uh, the, the answer is that can we, instead of asking general purpose theme-based questions, can we narrow down the focus to some of the activities which are relevant to that particular genre and register instead of digressing into other genres? For example, we have a tendency to bring a newspaper text to the classroom and make the students, I mean, students to speak on that topic. Maybe they are not ready to speak on a topic that they are really not familiar with. So can we contextualize our objectives in such a manner and bring such texts which are really going to help them with the interviews rather than general contexts of language use? That is one way of streamlining our instruction towards making people do something that we want them to do. Instead of giving them random speaking activities or five minute activities and so on, I think we have to organize our objectives to 
meet the requirements of the uh, particular registers that they are supposed to cope with. Uh, I think this is one of the uh, answers that I can give. So controlled focused activities where responses are extracted for specific questions are much more suitable than uh, asking students in general, what do you think? How do you feel questions? I think that's my response. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> sir, this is Rachit Agrawal, and I am a teacher training at the Asian Foreign Languages University Hyderabad campus. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to ask a question, but I want to make a comment. Uh, mm. uh, the overall, the overall uh, webinar was really nice, but I felt that uh, each of the sessions could be uh, spread out so that we could accommodate more uh, question and answer session, and uh, uh, the respective speakers could speak for a longer period of time on each of the topics. So this is what uh, I felt that. I had each of the talks been spanned out uh, and if the whole webinar would have been organized for two days, it would have been better. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the addition. Thank you for the comments. I will ask two persons to ask questions. One is Nilanjan Kosh and the second one is Nidhiya Singh. Please go ahead one by one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal. Your point is well taken and we will uh, discuss and uh, try to arrange uh, another webinar for two days in uh, September or something like that. But I do not, uh, I can't confirm it uh, without the consultation with Professor Mohan Raj. Uh, later we will meet in August and or September and after that we will confirm that one. Thank you. Over to Shumana. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Shubhana, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the NSOU for arranging such a seminar. Um, I really enjoyed, and I hope my, it has enriched myself as well as uh, others who are teaching English. Uh, it will be quite helpful for us, especially uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Mohan Raju's uh, lecture is really mind-blowing and even uh, I had some uh, uh, doubts regarding this everything was uh, I got an answer of this so I would like to um, uh, request the NMCU uh, Mononda is also here uh, to, uh, to arrange uh, this uh, this sorts of uh, seminars in future um, it will be quite helpful for us the teachers as well as the students. And this time, somehow, um, you missed uh, to inform me. Um, that's why I couldn't actively um, uh, participate. But uh, I hope the next time um, uh, I'll be, uh, I mean, participating in such a, um, and presenting the paper. That's all. Thank you again, Sumona. Thank you, Nilanjanda. Yes, so if, if you have any questions, we have, I think we are just in time. Uh, or shall we wind up the question and session over here? Question and answer session here? If somebody uh, has a question, we don't have any questions. Uh, I request our director uh, to speak something if you want to speak. In. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumanna. Could, could I ask, uh, make a comment? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes, sure, sure. <laughs> First of all, yes, it was such a pleasure to down. listen to all of you uh, and to uh, be connected across the miles with you. I'm Dr. Vindya and I work at Sultan Kabul University in Muscat, Oman. And um, it's such a pleasure to see Dr. Mohan Raj, who is also my teacher during uh, my uh, studies in the English and Foreign Languages University, and specifically uh, during my coursework for my PhD. 
such a pleasure sir to see you here thank you and dr samana also <laughs> and dr samana also for organizing and uh, taking initiative for a webinar like this a um, uh, uh, couple of things that i wanted to ask or you know i would like people to discuss more is one is soibal talked about mr soibal talked about the process of writing and the steps that he follows um i just wanted to know has he for, done any kind of empirical study in terms of action research to quantify the success of the process of writing so that it can be useful for other people in the elt community you know if you can actually publish uh, something on the relay, on the basis of what you've done in class that would be very helpful i feel i would like your response on this um i'll also like to share something on the process of writing which i have done during the last semester we had to go online almost overnight just like every other institution had to go on online and um, uh, i think there is uh, in spite of cultural differences that i teach arabic students while you teach indian students there is a common thread that students feel diffident and uh, they feel more shy when they have to come online and i did experience this quite a lot in when i was trying to teach them writing uh, one of the things that i noticed when uh, writing was introduced and the process of writing definitely was introduced we had a first draft we had a second draft and we did have a third draft for some of the students um uh, students um Uh, tend to want to have uh, a lot of uh, mentoring before they actually reach the fin final draft. Even if scaffolding is given, and even if uh, editing comments are given, without actually telling them what to do, they come back to you again and again for more specific instructions. It led me to think about two things. One, uh, is it because uh, the background with which they come is not uh, solid enough that they have to be taught basic grammar all over again and the basic structure of writing? And two, uh, what is it as teachers we can do in order to make them more independent in their thinking and therefore in their writing process? Because students in general tend to want to be uh, mentored a lot. that seems to be the norm across the world uh, when is it that they will wean away from the teacher and say okay i'm ready to do my own writing and i just need my uh, teacher if and when necessary somehow we don't seem to reach that point even at the third draft because when you write the next assignment it is all over all over the same story so i just want thoughts on this from everybody in this group here how do we make our students really independent because this world is changing and with this corona virus coming in it is no longer a situation where we are going back to the classroom immediately and even in online teaching there is likely to be changes which needs to be incorporated to adapt with the requirements for example we are on google meet today which would not have happened maybe one year ago yeah so these are thoughts i want you to, to come and join and the second one was to swati swati made a very interesting comment on language and society and the links of language and society to what extent do we really incorporate this into our classroom teaching experience and do our students made aware on of the societal context in which they function and the use of language in a particular uh, context in society i'm just throwing some questions because i would like anybody in the group to respond to this um because if we are to apply these practice these uh, presentations in practical reality uh, where do we what is our real take away from this thank you very much thank you bindia well uh, can i share am i audible yeah yeah yes yes you are yes, audible. yes thank you bindia ma'am um you know first thing is that you know uh, uh, whatever i presented it is not based on any empirical study this is absolutely based on my practice okay in my classroom sessions next is yes what you have faced i am facing the same first second third drafts even do not lead to make them independent writers they are still stuck. this will have, this is a matter of we all understand that writing is 
a very means this is the, the, the most difficult skill and it is a matter of time and practice and focus most of the times what happens with the students they are least motivated to at least at the advanced levels that i am facing they are least least motivated to actually practice and deal with the language this is, this is the first thing once they are out of the class they actually forget even if follow up tasks are given they do not engage into further kind of out of class discussion few hours of classroom interactions are extremely limited to actually develop that independent competence in writing because it requires a lot of things we all know but and rhyme and rhyme have you know am rhymes and rhymes are suggested there are various components and getting all those together it requires a lot of practice but if but i am hopeful that if we if the habit is grown gradually suppose in our engineering uh, colleges it's a four year course so we are getting the students for four long years if they can give some time and if they can give some time and deal with it and get into the practice i think some development would be there in terms of independent writing this is my conclusion Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay, Shona, uh, ma please uh, conclude now, right now. Uh, we have a shortage of time, and uh, uh, last time I'd uh, like to request Professor Mohan Raj if uh, he would address for a couple of minutes uh, to all the question in a summarized form, and after that we will go for vote of thanks. Only one submission from my end that there are several uh, good presentation and uh, good lecture. Uh, uh in this uh, webinar and i request my elt colleague joy shankar babu and shumona to go for another publication uh, uh, please consult to professor mohan raj and then go prepare for another uh, uh, publication because uh, juludi is not uh, <laughs> there right now so uh, if we go for another publication i think it will be better for us to Uh, incorporate all the thoughts and jots what are coming up are coming out in this uh, webinar. So what to Mr. Mohan, Professor Mohan Raj, and then to Shumona for wind up the um, whole webinar. A uh, Mohanda, just just for a minute, like as Ma'am has asked a question, can I take a minute, please? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Sure. Uh, madam, uh, Vindya, Madam, uh, Vijay, Madam, thank you. I mean, uh, sorry, Vijay, Vindya, Madam, thank you for your question. Uh, as you have asked, society and language. Uh, uh, just one point I would like to add here that definitely society and the social behavior. When I use the word society, it is a system, and everything works in that system. So speech and social behavior, they are constantly interacting. Even at the moment when we are interacting with each other, the chat box is uh, full of comments. and the i mean the comments that are coming up they are they have a different uh, pattern the syntactical arrangements are also different so this is how you, we can understand that society is constantly influencing our languages or the language that we use for whatsapp or in a uh, the language that we use during a formal interview situation all vary from one context to another right at the moment when we are questioning uh, we are using certain uh, polite principles so this is how uh, this uh, speech and so social behavior they are constantly interacting so society is at the, i mean it is as i've already mentioned uh, that language functions for the society it is by the society and it functions within the society uh, maybe in future as uh, as uh, mohananda and uh, shri mona madam had mentioned and uh, professor mohan raj sir has also mentioned maybe we can, if we take up these things in future we can go into further details thank you over to you shri mona ma'am May I request Dr. Nishan Kalwarshu to present the vote of thanks? Thank you. It was a very interactive question-answer session. Thank no, no. Before, 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 the, before that, uh, uh, Professor Mohan Raj, uh, I think uh, he he is in the line. So uh, we just hear want to hear from you for a couple of minutes. Okay, I'm joining the five million. Ah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Professor Mohan Raj, are you in the are you in the queue? Professor Mohan Raj. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Ah, uh, yes, yes, uh, sir. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you Just very much. Just summarize the whole thing, and uh, after that, we will conclude. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, 
asking me to summarize the proceedings for the day today. Uh, it's a wonderful session that we had, and I should congratulate the organizers, Professor Mandal, uh, Sumana, Jayashankar Basu, and uh, Intiaz Ali. Intiaz Ali, without him, I don't think uh, this would have been a possibility at all. What I liked about uh, this webinar is uh, the range of uh, topics that we discussed. Uh, they could be sort of uh, divided into about six different uh, categories. We had something on vocabulary where uh, Professor Jayshankar Basu talked about collocations in a, a very elaborate manner. His examples were uh, highly illustrative. And this was followed by a talk on morphology by Sadhan Kumar Day who also talked about inflectional and derivational suffixes. And uh, only thing is, I think he could have also talked about how these suffixes retain the meaning, sometimes change the meaning, retain the grammatical category, change the grammatical category. That's what actually makes it morphological study. And uh, that was, but, uh, but your uh, examples were excellent. I think uh, that's uh, worth it. But then we had two papers on uh, pronunciation. One was largely on dialects and accents, which was uh, there was a brilliant exposition by Professor Basudeva Chakrabarti. Uh, his uh, range, the, he, he covered a wide range of uh, dialects and how they are spoken in different areas. And uh, what I liked most about uh, his talk was how these can be mutually intelligible or exclusive. Uh, that that was a wonderful point that he made, uh, leading to uh, the problems of uh, uh, pronunciation, which was taken up by uh, uh, yeah uh, Shubhabrat uh, Sarkar, and he brought in the concept of NRP, which was uh, a wonderful thing. This is a more recent thinking, non-regional pronunciation. Uh, that's exactly what uh, internationally everyone is trying to att attempt, uh, how uh, you have to have a neutral accent and uh, you, your regionality cannot be pinned down because of your English. I thought that was a wonderful thing uh, that uh, Shubhabrat uh, Sarkar mentioned. Uh, we had a talk on discourse by Sumana. Of course, I, uh, she was very elaborate uh, in her examples. And uh, this is also part of uh, the PG ELT program. That's uh, it's a chapter there. I'm sure most of the students who are attending this uh, webinar would have benefited from that. And we had uh, two on very practical papers. One was on task analysis by Vijay Kumar, where he talked about the relation that exists between task and the text. I think this is a brilliant uh, re relationship that he brought about. And how, if we don't have the text, if we don't respect the text, uh, we cannot have any task. And how many different types of tasks we can have and the types of relations that, they can, that can exist between task and uh, text is something that he exposed and he has uh, in his synopsis he has given five different categories of tasks uh, that we can have which is very interesting I'll, and this was tied up with uh, process approach to writing by Saibal Chatterjee uh, I, in the, I, I take these two as a continuation in a, in a sort of a continuum because uh, Saibal Chatterjee was uh, talking to us about the type of uh, tasks that we can give as part of writing and how these can be developed in a real classroom. And then we had two other papers, one on uh, post-independent English education. This was more a historical paper by Durbadal uh, Datta. And finally, we had uh, one on language functions by Swati Basu, which was an excellent thing. I endorse the suggestion offered by Professor Mandel that all these should come up in the form of a book. So we will have totally um, four plus four, eight, nine papers. Nine papers may become a little too thin, but we can we can really think about it. Uh, maybe we can keep this open and uh, we can uh, think of a publication. And this can be dedicated to our friend Julu Sen, uh, who started this entire venture and uh, in the middle of all, all the work that we were doing. 
um, she left us. It's a, it's a sad thing that Julu left us in between. Maybe we can dedicate this book to her. Uh, we will plan it out. I'll uh, have a word with Professor Mandel and also Sumana. We will plan it out how the publication can come out. And uh, very soon, we will get back to you about writing these papers. Um, thank you very much. It was a brilliant session. And we also appreciate uh, your enthusiasm in participating and asking for uh, one more webinar, which can be more focused, certainly much more focused. Uh, perhaps this will happen sooner than later. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Shomana, please uh, wind up. Yes, sir. Now, may I request Dr. Basu to deliver the formal vote of thanks? Okay. On behalf of the Department of ELT, School of Humanities, NSOU, I extend my warmest regards and thankfulness to our director, Professor Manun Kumar Mandal, for his constant effort and egging on. And the result is the success of the webinar today. I extend my thankfulness and gratitude to Professor Mohan Raj for his participation, for his enriching address, keynote address, and for his role as a guardian over all of us. I extend my gratitude to Professor Vasudev Chakravarti, who once was my senior colleague, for his consent to deliver his address, lecture. And I extend my thanks to Intaj, Dr. Intaj Ali for the technical support and constant effort he put in to make, to make this webinar a success. I shouldn't thank Shumana. I should love her for her involvement, for her passion that's put into this webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now it's all over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Welcome. I, I, so now so maybe we can leave. We are meeting again in this type of webinar in the coming September. Come September. <laughs> in 